I'd like to open up uh, a hearing scheduled for 7 p.m., a continuation of a hearing on a subdivision of special permit for Kensington Estates off Glendale Road. The applicant has requested a continuation to October 27th, 2011. Uh, Carolyn, would that be 7 p.m.? Um, October 27th. Um, it could be, but I guess I would recommend 7.30 in case there's a smaller issue that we might want to take up ahead of time. So I would say 7.30 on the 27th. So if somebody wants to make that motion. Someone. <laughs> exactly. All right. Any discussion on that? <coughs> All in favor? Yeah. All right. I'd like to open up. I'd like to open up a hearing scheduled for 7 p.m. Uh, a zoning ordinance uh, hearing related to a package of changes to the King Street Corridor. Uh, this is a joint uh, hearing with the Planning Board and the members of the City Council's Ordinance Committee. Um, before uh, we get started the hearing, just for people who don't know how this, these joint hearings typically work, um, we're going to hear the presentations from the applicant, which is Carolyn in this case. We'll be taking comments and questions from the audience as well as from the board. Uh, as the two boards, we vote separately. The Ordinance Committee typically would vote back at their normally scheduled hearing, though it's their prerogative if they choose to vote at anything tonight that they can. The Planning Board can choose to vote tonight, or depending on how the discussion goes, we can decide to continue it. Um, the Planning Board's vote is a vote of recommendation or a vote of not recommendation to the City Council, but the Planning Board's vote um, does not stop the process. The, 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 the motions can still go, the, these changes can still come back to the City Council either with a recommendation of, of approval from us or a recommendation of not approval or no recommendation whatsoever. And the Ordinance Committee uh, will have their votes at either your next regular scheduled meeting or um, David, do you have anything you want to say before we jump in? No, we've covered it. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, a little clarification. I think it may be referred to other places besides ordinance. I believe Ed Blue um, Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use has already yeah. had at least one meeting on it, so it's been referred there as well. Yeah, because it's not on our agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I didn't want okay. to get yeah, because okay. I didn't know if this hearing would be continued or not <coughs> continued. So, yeah. Just for clarification, it won't be on our Monday. Yeah, we have our, our next, our next meeting is Monday, but we, I mean we've already posted the meeting, and so <coughs> this this is not on it because we obviously couldn't make that judgment without it. Exactly. Yeah, so, so we and, and one of the outcomes of tonight is we made both committees may decide to continue the meeting without voting tonight to a further meeting, depending on how the discussion and how the public input goes. So there doesn't necessarily have to be any votes tonight taken. We can continue this. We can vote, and either vote or can decide to vote uh, independently of the other. Um, Ed Lou. Did they, have they, they weighed in, did they vote? They voted to move it forward with a positive recommendation with some minor um, amendments, which I can go through um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so we'll hear what the end of these comments were when we do play. Okay. Um, so we're going to be looking at um, zoning changes for two different areas, King Street, uh, which is highway business, and a new area called entranceway business. Um, oh. Carolyn's going to be doing a presentation, but my own little brief history of this is this is a process that's been going on for almost two years. Um, it started with the chamber uh, hearing recommendations. Uh, it was then gone. It went through about a six-month process with the ZRC, the Zoning Revisions Committee, uh, was looking at it, and they had public forum. The chamber had their public forum. Um, it then went from the ZRC to the Planning Board. Uh, we had our discussions about it. It was then referred to City Council. So the council has now referred it back to these two committees for further discussion. Um, what would happen in terms of the course of events if both boards decide to vote tonight, then it would be scheduled for a future meeting of the city council. Uh, or uh, I don't think there's any other boards who have yet to weigh in. It's just Ed Lou and these two boards tonight. Um, all right, Carolyn, do you want to have to do your presentation? Sure. So um, I'm going to go over um, sort of a broad brush, and then we can go into details of the ordinance. Um, the King Street um, corridor zoning amendments really go um, affect the area, um, which is on the um, far southern part of this map, Main Street, 
all the way up King Street. This is Bridge Road, but the map is too tall. So it actually, the Highway Business District goes on uh, past Walmart into the River Valley Market. So that's the, the um, extent of the corridor. And the zoning changes really just are looking at this corridor. They're not, they wouldn't, um, um, there are some highway business districts elsewhere in the city which the design would affect, but primarily it's focused on King Street. Um, I'm going to go through the history and some of um, the goals in the summary, and then we'll review the edit, um, some minor edits that I spoke about um, that came through the EDLU Committee, Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use. And then obviously question and answers, because it's a dense package of ordinances um, that really filter in throughout the entire zoning ordinance relating to signs and site plan and things like that. <laughs> um, so a little bit more detail on the history, going back to 2002, the highway business standards for, um, were changed in 2002, but really only addressed retail establishments in the highway business district. King Street right now has um, three zoning, four zoning classifications going from Main Street all the way up to River Valley Market. But in 2002, the focus was really just on highway business, which at the time was from North Street north bound and really only affected the um, <coughs> retail establishments. In 2007, Sustainable Northampton plan recommendations um, were to look at King Street, really focus on um, different treatments for different sections and not just pull out the uses within different sections, but um, look at the corridor and segments. Um, so that was sort of um, the first impetus to reevaluate what was started in 2002. In April 2009, the Zoning Revisions Committee was created to implement, to um, provide recommendations to implement various aspects of the plan, not just um, commercial, but re on the residential side too. But in November of 2009, that committee um, <coughs> designated as part of its work a member to work with the Chamber of Commerce on. Um, evaluating and focusing just on King Street um, issues, zoning and uses and, and um, capacity and that kind of thing. Um, so a good seven months later in um, 2010, the Chamber submitted a recommendation to the Planning Board after its work doing outreach and evaluation of the corridor. In September, um, and at that point, the Planning Board asked the Zoning Revisions Committee to take it up and look at it, evaluate it, and the committee um, hosted two public forums, specifically on the recommendations. Um, and in November, um, there were some points of uh, remaining conflicting issues. For the most part, um, there was consensus on a lot of the package and a lot of the changes, but there were a few issues um, where um, we didn't have consensus. So there was a charrette held um, in November, and um, the outcome of that was then um, essentially um, uh, a document that went back to the planning board for um, sort of final work and to, to be put into ordinance. But in, through the winter and spring of 2011, the Planning Board um, reevaluated and debated those areas um, of remaining concern and conflict. And um, at the same time, or sort of parallel with that, which I'll go into a little bit later, there was a discussion um, and a charrette process that uh, the city hired Nelson Nygaard to look at King Street and the public infrastructure. The zoning aspects have been really been dealing with the private realm and development that would um, occur outside of that, of the corridor itself. And that um, was important to, um, uh, as part of the conversation to the zoning because they obviously relate um, very closely. So taking that feedback and input through the process with Nelson Nygaard, the planning board, in May or June of this year, um, finalized review tweaked some issues and areas um, based on the um, outcomes of the um, Elsa Nygaard Charette, and um, that's what's in front of um, the council tonight and the planning board for the public hearing is sort of that um, ordinance language based on all of that um, input. The goals of the 
uh, zoning from the outset were to create distinct um, sub-districts with different characteristics, create a consensus zoning that it would address urban design issues, but also um, the economic realities and looking at economic development opportunities, eliminate perceived barriers to redevelopment, improve the aesthetics and access for all users, build on the existing design criteria that was in the zoning, but apply that to um, equally across all uses in the corridor, or at least in the sub-districts, and create standards for private development that would anticipate um, complementary changes that would come along at some future date within the public infrastructure, so in the street itself. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll um, walk through the changes, a sort of a summary of the changes for each of those um, districts and um, go starting from Main Street going north to um, River Valley Market. Um, our changes to the Central Business District, which is the, um, the of the four districts that are in King or along King Street now, we have Central Business, we have a tiny bit of Urban Residential C, um, which I'll discuss a little bit in, in this um, area here that's highlighted in yellow. We have a General Business District, and um, we have a Highway Business District in the corridor. So currently, the um, Central Business District boundary is um, is on this um, southern end here. This is Trumbull right here, and this is the Catholic Church property. The property is actually split zone right now. This portion is central business. This portion is urban residential C. So there's this little tiny bit of urban residential C um, in this area. So the zoning um, change proposes to expand um, the central business um, boundary in this um, yellow squiggly area. The remaining portion of this is currently general business zone right now. So it's mostly general business except for this um, piece um, here, urban residential C. Um, this, the idea to change and modify this to central business addresses um, the conflict and, and concern about whether or not to mandate a second story for commercial buildings um, in this area or allow it as an option. So there had been a lot of discussion about um, the two-story requirement in the entire corridor, but um, particularly from the area um, leaving the current boundary of central business and going north and sort of how that would be treated. The planning board had a lot of discussion about this and um, felt that because this area is already um, two-story, um, primarily what we would call transitional residential building or architecture, um, that the idea that if you didn't have something that required at least two stories <coughs> as it would be required in central business, then someone could potentially tear down a two-and-a-half, three-story building and replace it with a single story. So um, that, that's sort of the basis for um, why this originally had been um, slated to be a different zoning district, but in the end, the planning board recommended that it would um, go to central business. Um, currently, the general business uh, district has very similar parking requirements as central business in that you don't have to reevaluate parking for the reuse of existing buildings. So there had been a concern, particularly about, um, from residential users in the um, surrounding court um, neighborhoods, that if you expand the central business district, that would have an impact and, and an increase in demand on parking. But in fact, um, general business and central business are very similar in parking requirements. So you would unlikely see changes to that. <coughs> and we anticipate that these structures will remain at, in their current state for a long time. That uses within the buildings would shift, but the actual building itself would um, probably remain. These are smaller lots um, with pretty solid um, foundation, building foundation. So I maybe I should stop there and ask if there are any questions about that section. Uh, just to clarify back on the, uh, on the previous slide. Yeah. Um, so uh, are we saying that the proposed change does re does mandate now the two story? Yeah. So central business um, has a minimum thirty foot height requirement. So um, you 
if you were to tear a building down, you'd have to have a minimum third. Thank you. This makes the the two um, zones for the, the church and the parking area turns it into one. Yes, yeah, so it would no longer be split zone, yeah. right? Excuse me. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, can we pull the comment? Should we wait till? It's up to you. I mean, I could go through. It might make more sense to go through the whole thing. Yeah, we'll do the public comment. Yep, we'll be playing last time we'll pull the comment. No problem. Um, so moving um, north, so this is North Street again, so the boundary of the proposed central business. So North Street, and you can see a little tail end of the rail trail here, and this is a um, National Bird property, um, and Finn Street here. So uh, moving along here, this section is proposed to um, contain a new zoning district for Northampton. Um, called Entranceway Business. And it's, it's based on the general business platform in that um, buildings are typically set right up close to the sidewalk and you can't have parking um, between um, the street and a building. You can have parking to the side of a building, but general business doesn't allow that, so we use that sort of as the foundation. Um, single story is allowed, but with design standards, um, unlike in general business. And the idea behind this was to create, again, a compromise to some of those conflicting issues that um, were debated back and forth about um, single story versus um, op you know, optional versus mandatory single story and setbacks um, and buffers between the streets and buildings. Um, again, no parking is allowed between buildings and um, the street in this proposed entranceway business, uh, like the general business district. And it's really seen as a transition zone between highway business um, further north and the central business boundary down here. Primarily on this side, you have single story buildings currently. Um, this is sort of mixed single and some um, older transitional residential, which are two and a half story. Um, this area was also viewed as crucial because there's access um, for the new uh, rail trail to the rear and crossing from this neighborhood, and also pretty good, I mean, we have problem intersections here, which we need to address in terms of pedestrian access across here, but for the most part, um, this is a more walkable section um, currently and we hope to make that even better in the future. Um, the idea also was that potentially we could use this district in other corridors, gateway corridors to the city. So we were not intending to create just this unique district just for um, King Street, but um, you know, to leave that flexibility. So then sort of going north, which is the rail trail north all the way to River Valley Market, um, are changes to the existing highway business district. Um, so in the last slide, we looked at the entranceway business zone. That area that was in yellow is all currently highway business. So that would no, it, if the zoning were to pass, that would no longer be highway business. And so now we're talking about a new highway business boundary starting at the rail trail and moving north. Um, and the modifications, the intention with, for these changes were to address concerns in the 2002 zoning related to um, mandatory um, either mandatory two-story or a payment in lieu of. This would allow optional two or more stories. Um, this, the focus now is more on site functionality and improved pedestrian safety. Um, there wouldn't, currently there's a maximum setback um, for, for some uses and this, that would be eliminated and as in its place would be much better buffer between the street and buildings and sort of enclosed pedestrian um, and bicycle facilities uh, enclosed by landscaping. Um, the idea, and again it goes back to a compromise um, with the setback, is to create a pedestrian, and it wouldn't, this is just a sample, might not necessarily look like that, but where you've got a sidewalk going from the main um, King Street to the principal structure that's flanked on both sides with a, you know, eight foot wide landscaped um, um, buffer and then a, a significant six foot wide sidewalk leading from the street 
Um, so that's what the eight, six, eight is. So eight feet of landscaping on either side of a six foot uh, wide um, sidewalk. And then a dense buffer band between the street and the parking lot, which um, would be, so if this were the street, you'd have a sidewalk and you have tree belt on both sides of the sidewalk. And this is a slide taken from the Nelson Nygaard study, just sort of more illustrative of how the layout of the street corridor might, might look um, with a bicycle facility in the street and then buffer on both sides of the pedestrian facility um, before you get to the private side development with the parking in the building. Uh, the changes in highway business also include more uses allowed by right and um, design elements um, which were taken, the foundation from which uh, were the 2002 <coughs> adopted guidelines. But these design elements, the goal is to make them apply to all uses and not just retail as they currently are. Um, the bottom illustration is, of course, not uh, that's from the Nelson Nygaard. Right. right. Because we have right now four lanes across, not three, right. with a medium. Um, um, but my question really was about the <coughs> excuse me, the um, optional two or more stories, mm -hmm. because uh, what we have presently is um, payment in lieu, payment in lieu of that. Only for <coughs> use, only for retail uses greater than 30,000 square feet, there is either a required second story or an optional payment in lieu of, but it only focuses on retail use. Maybe just for, because um, I wasn't at all the discussions, what was the reasoning behind the city giving up that payment piece? Um, it is um, considered burdensome and onerous, I think, for developers who are coming in um, looking at mixed uses and retails, it's an expensive element to add if you're um, um, doing office um, construction above retail. We um, looked at, in this section of King Street, it's um, um, unlikely to be an area that would attract um, development that would be two stories at this point in time. That may change in the future, and I think the idea is that with infrastructure improvements that potentially the city would make starting further south that over time we might be able to encourage more intense development um, that would be multi uh, Follow up just on your point a little bit about the picture at the bottom, you know, it's the three lane, two bike lanes. Yeah. One of the things I, I think that's important is to understand the difference between what zoning is what we're going to talk about, which is pretty much from the curb in King Street, if King Street ever had bike lanes like this, that's not a zoning change. We can't zone bike lanes on King Street. That would be as part of the redesign of King Street itself. So it's I think it, we, this might even come up tonight, we might even talk about it, whether that bike lanes on King Street make sense or not, because that was one of the things we talked about a lot when we were discussing the buffer and the sidewalk and the buffer here. But zoning, it doesn't control what's actually on that street. So. And I, I just want to go back to the point, um, um, Councillor, about the two-story versus one-story in this section. The other issue is... Um, <coughs> There's a lot of um, office development and multi-story buildings in central business and um, potentially at the state hospital where it's more desirable to have offices <coughs> in second floor residential that we haven't built out the capacity there. So the, the demand for um, that type of office slash retail or residential above retail is not um, being met yet in other areas that are more attractive, so we don't think that the market is quite right yet for that kind of development this far out. I was curious, the, um, the pedestrian buffer slash promenade, yeah. um, how does what's proposed in the zoning compare to what's on the ground, like the, some of the stuff that's already happened, you know, yeah. whether in front of the fire station or in front of the dealerships where there's yep. you know, been plantings and trees and all that as part of the permitting. Yeah. How will that? Well, we compare? do require um, 
landscaping currently in the zoning along the public street, the sidewalk, so there's a tree belt requirement. And there is a separation, a 10-foot separation um, required between sidewalks and parking lots. But the, the specificity of the plantings and the, the number of plantings and the, um, I guess the density of the plantings in the proposed zoning are much greater than what's there. So we do have something along King Street now. The, 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 um, the part that's different is the connector. And, we, and the, the zoning ordinance also requires um, a sidewalk connection from the street to the building, but it doesn't say it has to be flanked by X feet of landscaping on both sides. The idea about this connector is that you create a safe sort of comfort zone for pedestrians that might be walking along King Street and then trying to access a building that might need to cross a big parking field. And so having a much um, more substantial buffer on both sides of the sidewalk leading you through a parking lot um, it counteracts or counters the, the um, um, problems that you might experience now walking across a huge open parking field with, your, with limited land. Um, oh, just one more question, because there was some there was some confusion about um, the buffer area in terms of <coughs> who's responsible who's responsible for that. Is it the the developer entirely, well, or just <coughs> currently um, under the criteria um, when an applicant comes forward and, and wants to build a site, they need to meet the zoning ordinance. So on the parcel on the private side, they would need to meet, and their responsibility would be to build the landscaping and the, and the, um, the landscape islands between the parking um, stalls. Um, we also require um, not just in the highway business district, but throughout the city and commercial districts, sidewalk sidewalk construction along the frontage of your property if it's not there or if it's um, insufficient. So if it's a three foot by two minute sidewalk, you need to expand it to a five foot. Um, and that's there currently, that requirement. Um, also, tree belt um, plantings are required currently. So that is anticipated, that would stay the same. So those same standards that apply in terms of who's responsible. But it's only for um, projects that are coming forward. You, so if this went on the ground tomorrow, all of a sudden, we wouldn't be requiring all the property owners to suddenly comply with the zoning ordinance. It's only as projects um, redevelop or sites redevelop. <coughs> so the, the developer then would be responsible up to the street for that? Right. Uh, okay, right. And that was probably my, sort of my question a little bit was, oh, okay. will, is it going to, will it be incongruous with what's there already? I mean, if, if yeah. how, how, how out of whack will it be in terms of where, uh, what's there now versus a new development? You know, sidewalk going to shift? Is it going to be wider? Is it going to, you know, how is that going to look? Well, originally, um, uh, one of the concepts actually going into the charrette and probably, I guess, coming out of the charrette was to have a um, three bands, 10 foot, um, 12 foot, and 10 foot. Um, so 10 foot um, buffer flanking, a 12 foot wide multi-use lane, so, or path. So that would be this piece here. Um, and that was to accommodate bicycles and pedestrians in the same layout, essentially. Um, and that certainly would have been a huge um, shift from what's out there now, because that's a much wider sidewalk than we. But we're building or uh, requiring applicants to build um, five-foot sidewalks primarily, I would say, um, as opposed to six-foot sidewalks now. So what's on the ground for properties that have turned over are five feet. So going to a six-foot wide sidewalk is not dramatically different. And we, we have the 10-foot tree belt anyway, so you can have the option of building. So part of the problem on King Street is we have a lot of grandfather development um, that was built out years ago. So it's going to, this is a process. It'll take a long time for sites to turn over and redevelop. Um, so for a while, you'll see sort of potentially zigging and zagging. But the whole, the concept of creating these um, buffer strips was based on what's been um, starting to, to um, arise out of um, zoning that occurred over the last 10 to 15 years. So that we've been building on those projects like the fire station. Was 
that the end of your question, Carol? Um, yes, and then I, if you want, I can go through some of the modifications, or, or we could go through some of the, the detailed ordinance language. So whatever you want to do. Well, next. I guess, uh, so what I was saying, <coughs> because there's, there's really two big pieces, entranceway business and highway business. And I was going to say, do we want to concentrate on, say, entranceway business first, go through that, take questions, take comments, and then move on to entranceway business? And that way we're not going to be talking back and forth between the two. I know. Yeah. 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 It might be difficult. People might get confused if we're going back and forth doing everything at the same time. So. Are you any essential business first? Or actually, yeah, excuse me. There's, yes. the, there's the central business, actually. So it's really the central business and the Twitch business and the private business. So if we do them one at a time, we can have people can comment on each one as we do it. Uh, for, when we do public comment, if we're talking about central business, I would say try to keep your comments to our central business, and then we're going to do entranceway business, and then we're going to do highway business. Uh, uh, does that sound good? The, um, it's actually, the central business changes are by far the smallest uh, in terms of uh, what we're proposing. Entranceway business are a little bit more, and highway business are the ones that's probably going to have the most discussion anyway. So if we do them in that order, we might be able to get through the fast. So uh, really the changes are uh, constitute a map change for central business. So it's really this area um, right here. Um, this, the white pink here represents the general business boundary um, that's being proposed to go to central business. And then this area here is the urban residential C. It's uh, simultaneously being proposed to be rezoned to central business and also expand the central business architecture review uh, map that would go with it, so that goes hand in hand. Now, have, as part of um, the process, we looked at changes to central business, to the, to the zoning tables. Have those already, we're not talking about those things, those have already gone through. Right, so we separated that out, that's a good point. Um, I think council passed a second vote last week or two weeks ago on the central business changes, which means the table of use change, um, height change, height change um, some of the uh, parking, parking. Um, changes, right, with some minor modifications to that. But So that, the use and the table have um, been adopted. Um, so this is really just expanding the boundary. Right, so the only thing we're looking at tonight is just changing the map to include those two areas into central business. From Trumbull to North, basically. Uh, right. So, as we're talking about just that one piece now, we'll do entrance way business and highway business next. Any comments or questions from the board about that particular part of the zoning change? Or, Carol, did you, any, any other things you want to, any other, <coughs> pretty much your presentation on this? No. Yeah. And do you have any comments on this, on central business, on this portion? No. Um, um, any questions from me the board on this particular part? open it up to public comment now. Uh, okay. So uh, what I like to do is then um, open up to public comment this one particular part. So that we're talking about the map change for central business, which is to incorporate one small piece of URC and one piece of GB into URC, this one map change. Um, so on that particular piece, if the public would like to have a comment, I would say come up to the podium, state your name and address, and uh, have your comment. Hi. Uh, my name is Joe DeFazio, and I have a question, not so much a comment. When I went on the planning board's website, I saw that map, and then I saw your graph in the beginning of your presentation, and it seems, um, my question is, is Edward Square, the residences on Edward Square, going to be changed from URC to CB? Because it seems that way on that map, but it didn't seem that way on your graph. Um, no, your this graph. should be pretty consistent. Just this that. is Edward Square, so it would really only be this front parcel here, and then this is the church. So it's the parcel abutting King Street. But the rest of these, um, this is all would remain 
in urban residential city. It would. Yes. Okay. That's not being proposed to be changed. Right. So. Exactly. That's what I. That's my only question. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else on the URC piece have a comment or question? Um, okay, so um, maybe then procedurally, well, we can vote uh, on these individually. So we've had the public comment. We haven't closed public comment yet. Um, so we as the planning board can close our public comment and vote on this one piece now if we feel comfortable. Um, we could close public comment on this piece, have all the votes later. Ordinance, you guys. Your decision to vote here, but I think you guys usually vote at the next meeting. So you can keep public comment open until your next meeting and do your vote there. So I'd say if we're comfortable with this one change, we've heard from the public, if we want to close our public comment, so it's perfectly fine for that. That would be my, my favorite. And because the comment was that particular thing. Right. So what we do is we do a motion to close the public comment for the planning board. Then we get a motion either to approve to not approve or to, pass, to move on with no recommendation whatsoever. That's our option. We don't have it. That seems tricky to me to close public comment on one section. We could wait till we've heard all of them and vote later on tonight. I, I think you probably want. I think it's worth just continuing uh, continuing this and closing the public hearing. Okay, because so it's sort of tied together. Okay, yeah. that's fine. All right, then let's. People, we won't do anything now. Let's change our conversation to entranceway business. Then, if we're done, with, but there's no other comments on this this part of central business. We'll keep our public comment open. Right. The only the only other caveat that I just um, realized is that it would be for this particular map change. Um, we need to go back and make sure each um, property owner was notified. So we should probably keep that hearing open for that, just to make sure that individually they get that notice. So just for this piece, because for map changes, you're required to notify individual property owners. So maybe we won't vote on this one right. tonight at That's all? That's what I would recommend, yeah. Okay. All right, then we'll save our votes and close up on the comment to we vote for them all. All right. Uh, we'll watch the legends for business. Um, I just have one more question about the entry entryway business, and you mentioned this er earlier, Carolyn, um, that uh, change it, that there is no change in the parking. When we had one of the, there was one of the community meetings that we had, and folks did express that concern that the change would, you know, push more parking onto their streets. But I think what I heard you say was that um, the change from. Uh, um, General business, general business. I mean, highway business, even to um, entryway business. How will that impact? How will that impact the parking on, on streets? So from <coughs> from Trumbull North up to um, whatever the church to. Right. So um, the way that the um, the way that the parking. Um, um, would work to the table. Um, so there, you know, this would apply to highway business as well because the proposal is um, to um, for the entrance for the entrance business. Um, the parking requirements would be. Just like general business, so if you're building a new building or new footprint, um, footprint expansion or brand new building, then your parking would be based on um, the use table that we have now. Um, but if you're reusing an existing building and you're not changing the footprint, you're not, you know, adding on, um, then there wouldn't be a recalculation. Of So it's fair to say that there would be little impact on the residential streets and entranceway business in terms of um, additional parking pressure on those streets. Right. Yeah. The parking would primarily be taken 
on site, so on the commercial side. Okay. Thanks. Um, do you want to go through the? Uh, do you have an overview of the highlight of, for industry business? Or um, yeah, I um. Again, so if I had the table up here, you've seen this table format before. The, um, uh, as I mentioned previously, this is these are again we use general business as a as a platform for um, uses. So um, uses would be very similar that uh, as allowed in central business and, and general business. Um, the one item that is was a, a point of big discussion, I guess, was um, this um, drive-through um, aspect and drive-through uses. Um, so currently, uh, in, in general business, um, drive-throughs, um, I think, are not allowed. Um, um, maybe getting a step in the business, but the special permit criteria is what really um, is different in this case. And, and that also links back to the, their specific criteria of how a special permit would be granted if you have a drive-through establishment. So the idea is to allow office with a drive-through component um, by special permit, um, but restaurant drive-through establishments would not be allowed in this district. And that is, um, that is a clarification and specification is different in this district. Um, so, other than that, sort of your the, the idea is to have allow as many commercial uses as possible, but look at the ones that really have impacts on pedestrian um, access and safety, and um, ensure that those are only um, appropriately cited to offset any of those pedestrian impacts. Um, so this typical things that would be allowed, mixed use would be allowed, office, medical office, um, banks, restaurant, entertainment, that kind of thing um, are allowed in this district. And then the, the new um, concept would be um, building design. So there's, there would be facade um, review essentially by the planning board for building elements and the focus is um, glazing on the first floor that um, really would address pedestrian scale um, activity um, and, <coughs> excuse me, more detailed landscape standards in sort of three bands, the buffer, excuse me, <coughs> the buffers along the street um, and within the parking lot. So that's different from the current general business standards. I think in terms of um, that buffer, there's been a lot of discussions about the buffer and the options. In an entranceway business, there's essentially two options. If if the applicant builds a building right up onto the sidewalk, then there's no buffer required between the sidewalk and the building. And so that's like Main Street downtown to try to get the buildings right up onto the sidewalk. There is an option, though, if they want to build them back. Then there's got to be a buffer, a planted buffer, between the sidewalk and the building itself. So the goal of entranceway business is kind of to, is really to encourage people to build up to the sidewalk, uh, much like central business. Um, the other thing in the entranceway business, we had a lot of discussions. I think Carolyn mentioned was the second story requirement. And so entranceway business will continue to require the second story. No, oh, that, that was the that was a compromise. Right. Is it? That was it. Right. It does so not require. <coughs> but it does require design standards. Yes. Yes. Okay. And in terms of the buffer, what's the um, what's the minimum um, length of that? Uh, so the the there would be sort of um, it would range depending on whether if your building was at the street, then you wouldn't have to put a buffer between the side or the sidewalk, I should say, between the sidewalk and the building. But if you um, did want to step your building back, there would be an eight foot buffer. But then there's a ten foot buffer required, which is currently required. Um, between a sidewalk and any parking area. And the extra two feet is to account for impacts of cars that are parked right up to the end of that buffer that might overhang, so you're, you might lose a little bit of that buffer anyway, but it's a 10-foot depth um, between the sidewalk and any parking lot. 
Okay, and in terms of, uh, do I read that correctly to say where it says any residential use <coughs> above the first floor mm -hmm. um, is allowed? Yeah. So does that mean that residential uses are no longer allowed at all? Uh, I mean, I, I know that currently residential on the ground <coughs> floor is not allowed in central business, general business, um, or highway business. Right. So it, it stays exists, the same. It exists now only as grandfathered. Right. Okay. Right. And so it, would, it wouldn't be grandfathered um, if the building came down. It, it would be allowed on the second floor, but... Right. Okay. And the idea is really to intensify the commercial aspects along the street. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Or board? So we're going to open this, open up entranceway business to public comment. So um, now we're going to have uh, public comment on entranceway business. So if anybody from the public would like to comment, um, like Mr. DeFazio, step up to the podium, <coughs> name and address, and uh, have your comment. Hi, Terry Anderson, uh, Community and Economic Development Director for the City. Um, I prepared my comments as a block, so I'm going to try to piece them out uh, by district, so if I miss something, you have it in writing. Um, and I might just, my opening comments, I think, will relate to all the, all the districts. So, um, But first I wanted to thank you, the Zoning um, Committee, and the uh, Chamber of Commerce for all of the work that you did to, to make this a collaborative process and to reach out to the businesses and the residences along the corridor. Um, I think that was an important aspect of all of this. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to lay out, you have it in writing, the things that I think that are beneficial about the proposals. Um, some of the questions, I have a few clarifications and questions and suggestions for some additional tweaking. Um, I, I think I have some additional clarification based on the conversation that's happened so far. But in terms of entranceway business, I had a question about the drive-through establishments. Um, as I read that section, the 30, section 350-16 that um, says that for establishments that require a special permit. So that, that only applies to entranceway business. It doesn't apply to highway business. Is that correct? Because highway business right. is allowed by special, by, by site, site plan. plan. Allowed by right, by site plan. Okay. So um, I guess the one concern I would have is um, I think the design requir requirements that you um, have provided for are fine. The one concern I would have is that um, only allowing drives throughs on um, when it's not the principal use on the lot is overly restricted. So for instance, an individual standalone building, um, like a bank building, with a drive through would not be allowed in entranceway business under these requirements as I read them. I would, I would say that's not the right interpretation. Okay, so explain to me. It's, what and, and one of the modifications that I was going to go through is to clarify that it's, if the drive through in and of itself <coughs> is the principal use, then it wouldn't be allowed. But a drive through I would say, is an accessory to a bank. So the bank is the principal use, but there's a drive through component. And that was the intention of the ordinance. OK. And I would suggest that you clarify that in your definition, because Right, and that's, that's what I was going to go through as one of the modifications. OK, great. Thank you. Um, also, for <coughs> entranceway business, um, the lighting standards, um, I've gotten a little bit of feedback from site designers, and one of the suggestions was is that the highway in, in uh, entranceway business that the uh, light pole height should be 25 feet, the same as in highway business. So I would recommend that as well. In part because there are larger sites in, in the entranceway zone, um, and with shorter poles, you have to have more poles on the site to get the proper light coverage. I think that's everything for entrance for business. Most of the comments are on highway business. Thanks. That's good. Uh, anybody else from the public like to speak about entrance? Bill Dwight, 39 Myrtles. And, and just a uh, uh, follow up on that, my concern about the 25 foot pole 
furniture way business that's still proximate to a lot of residential dwellings. And the, the thing about entryway business, and actually, if you look through the Myrtle Street, it's not far from there. But uh, the my only concern is is uh, light pollution, as far as that goes, or how it impacts the neighborhood. I don't even know if it would. So I'm not saying, but I I think that it would. It's just that it's bigger brains and people with greater knowledge could probably calculate that and the effect that it would have on immediate abutters just behind most of those uh, those potential businesses. That's it for entryway. Anyway. Any other comments on entrance way? Well, if you want to wait until the people are the comment, then we'll have a chance again. Um, yeah, okay. You can. Anybody else? All right, Andrew, go ahead. Um, I guess maybe I missed, I know as I'm not traveling, so maybe I missed the, the compromise where we lost the second story or the height or something. And, um, I think there's two things that really define how a street feels. Um, one is the height of the building, and one is the setback. Um, the setbacks are fine, but I'm very, very concerned about losing the second story requirement. I think it's going to really impact. I mean, I'm right. We've lost the second story requirement in the business, right? Come on. It would only be, I mean, currently, second story is only required from retail establishments over 30,000 square feet. So if other uses came in in the highway business district that were not retail, then they could do single story. Right, but we could put in a second story requirement for any of way business. Right now. I mean, we could. And I think, I think, to be honest, we should. And I think, um, I think we're moving in the wrong direction on this, quite frankly. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, and I don't think a, a, a planting strip ever works to, to actually replace the real impact of solid masonry on, on, on how you feel when you drive down the street. And um, personally, it's not what I want to see in that sort of business. And I'm quite prepared to say right now I'm not going to vote for this as it stands. We did have a lot of discussions about entrance business uh, with the second story. One of the issues that came up was the expense of things like elevators. But one of the things that was originally, and this is, I think, the theory of the compromise Carolyn was referring to, the original goal was that entrance business was much closer to downtown. Mm -hmm. And what we did is, from the planning board side, we wanted to push central business farther out north on King Street. And as part of pushing central business out, which does have a second story requirement, we then said, OK, we're going to be pushing central business farther out, then we can say we're still going to have a 20-foot height minimum on entrance way business. So you still have to do 20-foot height. But we're willing to then say we don't even require the second story for that, that part. So that was our yeah. That does make a, a, I understand the logic. I just, I just think it's moving in the wrong direction in terms of what we should really be doing for how we want to see Northampton in the future. It's not just about making it cheap for developers to come in and do, do things. It's about how we want to really think of this town and what the infrastructure looks like 30, 40 years down the road. Um, and the buildings and, and, you know, I mean, we have a great main street and we can, and we can see that expanding out. We don't have to turn it into, you know, Walmart. Um, and, I, and I think it's in the wrong direction. Comments from the point of information. Just uh, I is it twenty foot minimum or thirty foot minimum? In entrance way business, it's a twenty foot minimum, sixty five foot maximum. No second story requirement. Uh, central business, I'm not gonna bite me to get this numbers right. Twenty foot min, thirty foot min, two story requirement. Well, it's not a two-story requirement. It's just you're not going to build practically 30-foot height without having a second. That's why I should have the book in front of me when I try to quote these things. Before I have Carolyn here, it's much easier. Uh, but yeah, there was a lot. I mean, that was one of the. I think Carolyn even had one of her slides. One of the big discussions we had um, about entrance foot businesses was the biggest sticking point was the second story. 
and that was we had at these two meetings where that was the sole discussion, almost the sole thing we talked about. Right? Yeah, and in general, I've always been in favor of second story requirements under these circumstances, and I agree with Andrew, but I'm not going to vote against it. Uh, well, I think that the, and this is my take on it, was by moving central business farther north, three, I can't remember if it was three or four blocks north that we moved it, we added that requirement to the part that's much closer to downtown. And that left entranceway business without the second story requirement for places like the old Toyota dealership um, and places like that. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was, I was comfortable with that. That's the top part. I think part of your discussion was because this doesn't apply to retail right now, if we strict standards for high business, someone could, under the current standards, could do the old Honda site with a one story car lot on the rear of the property and maybe feet of parking. So it's not necessarily getting worse. No, but it should be getting better. That's my point. It shouldn't be not getting worse, so we just keep on doing it. The point is, this is our chance to change it, and we should make it better, not worse. All right, but again, I'd argue one story buildings are on the street. Well, yes, but it's, it, it should be better. That's my, my conviction. Didn't the Nelson Niagara uh, Charette, I, I went to it, but I can't remember whether they recommended two stories straight out from the street. Or what, what did they? No, yeah, they didn't get into land use law. They didn't get into that. They, they were really focusing just on the public route. Because okay. this is more of a form based code question that we're talking about. Yeah. How we want the streets to look, as Andrew says. Anything else on the entrance way business? We're actually moving along faster than I thought we were going to do it. I would do it. The big one. So. Um, okay. um, quick question. Um, so, <clears throat> entrance, entranceway business, um, the proposed entranceway business is presently highway business right now. And so, right now, there is no requirement for a second story, but there are incentives. Um, for the developer if they put on a second story presently under the highway business zoning that exists now, is that correct? Um, there aren't um, really any incentives for a second floor. Um, if you were to do um, a large retail development, which the only place you could do that in that section would really be the old Honda site. <coughs> um, so, you know, we've heard people argue that it's um, an incentive to do a second floor, or it's a penalty if you don't do a second floor because there, there's payment in lieu of. But it's really just for retail. So if you wanted to do a 30,000 square foot retail building on that site, um, you would have the option currently of making a payment in lieu of or doing a second floor. Only if it's a retail. Only if it's retail, right. But if it were auto dealership, restaurant, office, any of those other, any other possible use, bank, you know, um, you could come in with a single story building. It could be as big as you want. It could be the biggest bank <laughs> um, this side of the Mississippi. It could still be one story. Um, no, another point of information on that. It's just that uh, actually there were additional incentives for reduction of open space requirements and parking requirements to, to promote building up the sidewalk and second stories that were part of the 2002. So there were there were there was an incentive package, maybe it wasn't enough, but there was There was incentive for parking um, and landscaping requirements. So you could get a reduction in open space. But that open space didn't relate to the second floor. I mean that open space would be could be for any use as opposed to just um, okay. and um, I'm I'm a little unclear. Does the present highway business uh, allow any second floor uh, residential? Yes, currently it does. Okay. So you can do residential up to, um, I guess, 40 feet um, right now, uh, or office on the second, third, or however many floors you can get in, in, in highway business. In highway business. Okay. And so now we, we have a 65 foot maximum, so if someone wanted to do second, a second story uh, residential, so ground floor, retail, or whatever, mixed use. Mm -hmm. right. But there's no incentive for that, per se. Right. Okay. Also. Yeah. 
that answer my question. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. oh, uh, we'll move on to highway business if everybody's. Um, I guess before, I'm just going to look into this package here. Um, I don't know where, if you want to go over the um, detailed um, other language that addresses sort of all districts now or after you go through the, <coughs> the highway business section and come back to these little details. Well, uh, actually, the one thing I meant to ask about entrance with business, did Ed Lou have any comments about entrance with business? Um, there was discussion about um, buffers, but I don't think, I think really the comments were um, more focused in the highway business section, if I remember correctly. That's happened since then. <laughs> Two days. <laughs> well, so uh, with highway business, which is the most complicated, do you want to? We can go to that. It's kind of hard to show yeah. that language. Um, you know. Yeah, I wish. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm, I feel comfortable looking at zoning tables, but it's not the greatest thing for the audience to. Well, I mean, I could summarize sort of what's in this table, and, <coughs> and all this is on the web page um, for those who want to read it line by line, or we can certainly go by. Uh, Watch it. Let's yeah, start with a summary. Start with the summary of the change, yeah. the major changes, and the changes. Okay. To the existing. So, um, I guess, you know, we, we talked about the heights, um, um, increasing the height um, up to 65 feet um, allowance. Uh, a lot of the use, many special permits um, were eliminated um, and either moved to site plan or by right, um, and allowing more flexibility of uses and, and those mixes. Again, res ground floor residential is not allowed, is it, it's currently not allowed, but it's allowed on the upper floors. Um, design standards and landscaping changes um, dramat have been, I would say, dramatically changed and that there's much more detail about not just the buffer um, between the sidewalk and the property, but also within the site, detailed, more detailed language about how you do the landscape um, planted islands, incentives for doing <coughs> some, uh, more sustainable um, grasses as opposed to just throwing in crab grass. Um, and then reduction, the other big item is really the reduction in um, parking requirements down to zero. So there's a lot of discussion about that, the concept behind reducing the parking um, and bringing it to zero is that um, we've had applicants come forward many times asking for a reduction, which you can under either site plan or special permit. but um, given that this section of the corridor doesn't have the same kind of infiltration and impacts potentially to residential neighborhoods, that uh, developers could decide, um, or site owners could decide how much parking they felt was necessary for their proposed use. So the zoning, um, the concept is the zoning shouldn't stand in the way if someone wants to provide 10 spaces instead of the required 55, then why should we make it a burden to have them come through a special permit process just to provide 10 if that's really all they need? Um, and then um, the building design standards are moved. Uh, there they were in the site plan section now. The idea is to create sort of a packet of um, landscaping and building design standards that would become part of the zoning um, table for highway business so that you have your highway business uses and then you have design, the design standards right there. Um, again, using the, the existing standards for retail, they've been modified to address um, all uses and apply to all uses. Um, but instead of sort of recreating design standards, the idea was to use what's on the ordinance, on the books now, and, mod and modify those um, slightly. And there are even further tweaks that we've made since the introduction of this ordinance because um, the more times you look at it, the more you realize how much it really was focused on big box retail from 2002. And so some of those standards really had to be modified to, to relate to different uses like banks and restaurants um, and non retail establishments.
So I guess, you know, even to summarize the board, the primary changes are the current regulations, <coughs> the current regulations, the current zone regulations for, for big boxes of what they're called, primarily apply or only apply to retail establishments. Right. So in highway business, a uh, 40,000 square foot retail establishment would then have what we're calling the big box requirements applied to it. But a 40,000 foot bank, car dealership, they didn't apply to those buildings. So one of the changes for King Street is to take and apply these same zonings to all uses along King Street, not just retail. Uh, one of the changes then is to remove the second story requirement, replace it with the minimum and maximum pipe. I think Carol alluded to Carol alluded to the requirements of special permits. And for for a lot of people who don't know what that means, it means a special permit meant if somebody wanted to put, I think even a bank on, on highway business, if someone wanted to put a bank on King Street, they had to come to the planning board and get a special permit because it wasn't allowed by right. So we're removing that because we want banks on King Street. We think they're okay, so they don't no longer have to come to the and planning medical board. Medical office is another medical one. office. Those are things that we want. Um, we probably spent the most time over the past 18 or 19 months talking about the buffer and the sidewalk. I'm not sure if you have on your, you can show what the design guidelines yes. yep. look like. Uh -huh. So as you notice that table, which just went away, under land, <coughs> there's a, there's a sentence that says, see design standards below for required treatment. So a lot of what we talked about was, if you can't get the buildings right up on the street on King Street, right on the sidewalk, like Main Street is in downtown. What can we do between the street and the building to make it look presentable on King Street? And that's where we talk about this, a 10-foot tree belt built from the street, then a sidewalk, then a planted buffer, oh, there it is, and then parking, and then the building behind it. And then there's also design guidelines for what the parking lot has to look like, with the road, with the, with the uh, sidewalks from King Street through the parking lot have to look like. That was what Carolyn was talking about, the eight-foot buffers on either side of the six-foot sidewalk that led from the street to the building itself. So the design guidelines will be enacted. That, oh, can you go back up one here? Yeah. That picture up there is the idea of what a parking lot would look like. So you have a street, a tree belt, the sidewalk along the street, planted buffer in front of any parked cars. Between rows of parked cars, there's an aisle, a planted aisle. And then this is the sidewalk that Carolyn was talking about <coughs> that goes from the sidewalk along the street. It's a, a way for pedestrians to get from the street across the parking lot in a safe way to the building itself. So these are the design guidelines that will be proposed as part of the zoning change. And I think this is where we spent, for the last 18 months, I think we spent more time on this than almost anything. And then, so uh, while we're on here, there, the, there's some highlighted text here that represents some of the, uh, again, as I mentioned, additional changes that we've looked at. Um, one was to create an incentive in this area for this eight-foot um, um, landscape area to um, reduce that to six feet um, on either side if you're using some kind of engineered stormwater system or rain garden, um, also referred to as low impact um, um, development or design standards for stormwater. <coughs> so that language is added here as a highlight that I would recommend. It came out, um, Edwin recommended that that language go forward as well. Um, and so I would put that on the table as a modification to the package that actually was originally introduced. Um, it relates to that sort of pedestrian air um, um, access. And then the other highlighted point up here is there's been discussion um, actually coming out of Edlu about whether if you have a um, uh, maybe further down on King Street, if you're closer to the bike path or rail trail, if you have, if you're also doing a connection in the back from the bike path, does this language then require that you have um, flanked sidewalk uh, with um, buffer um, for the sidewalk, but also on the bike path. So I would think that, or, or a bike path link anyway, and I would think that um, it would make sense to 
eliminate this um, language here that says you have to do both if you are doing um, bike path and sidewalk that you have to flank both of those with um, landscaping and that the sidewalk, the primary pedestrian access is what would be the important thing if you're coming from the rear with a bike path that um, as an incentive to do that, maybe not have the same landscaping requirement. <coughs> And that's what, that came from Edward? Um, there was discussion about that. What if you wanted to do um, a bike path um, also? Um, could you have some kind of incentive to reduce the landscaping requirement? Because I think it's... They didn't know. vote on that language per, in particular, but I'm just... Um, that's all we should discuss it because most of the buildings on the east side of King Street are ones that we're going to require a bike path access to. Well, except in this area, there probably won't be bike paths. I mean, this far north, uh, you probably have it as far down. I mean, Walgreens would be the sort of the last connector point. So there would be a couple of those properties. But because that's where the tunnel connection is to the Narwada, um, that would be sort of the extent of the bike path um, in that area. <coughs> so I don't, I don't, I, the, the language is clear that you need to make accommodations for bicycle and pedestrians in the current language. So I, I'm not suggesting take that away. I'm just about this design standard, whether or not you would want to require the landscaping design aspect for both a pedestrian access coming from the street as well as a potential bike path access coming from the rear of the site. I think in, what we've been doing right now is the connector, we, place where we've required a connector, um, there is, we just have them, I think we've had them strike a path through the lot. Walgreens, when Walgreens did theirs, so I think yeah. there was a striping, but I don't think there was, there was It depends, it's site specific too. <coughs> what? Oh. It's site specific too, so I mean, if you're talking about um, an, an area where the buildings are typically going to be set to the rear anyway, and your the bike path is at the rear, then you have a much closer connection. You're not coming across the field of parking like right. you would be as a pedestrian coming from the from the street to the building. So it's not <coughs> probably not as much of a um, um, a concern in terms of creating that um, comfort level at the rear of the site. Um, Mark? I, I, wouldn't, I don't have an issue with the, that bottom language being added, but that the, the public bike language doesn't seem necessary because it seems so limited as to which properties in the bike path north, like you're saying the Walgreens is the only property that this would apply to. It's probably the farthest north that it would apply right, to. Right, right. And so it, it's, a, it's a different animal. To me, getting from King Street, if I'm... Um, walking on the sidewalk from King Street and I need to go through a sea of asphalt to get to the front door is one thing. If I'm on the bike path on the back side of the building, is, to me, as long as there's a designated path, I don't think it needs to be landscaped in the, in the same manner as coming off King Street. Yeah. I tend to agree with what Mark said. I mean, if you're on the bike, it only takes four seconds to cross the parking lot. It doesn't happen. The other thing we could do is, uh, as Carolyn said, if, if, if the building is at the front of the sidewalk, though, and you have a long way to go across the uh, parking lot, it might be beneficial. I'm not sure if we believe it is. It's a site plan decision, or well, um, the design standards would be part of site plan review. Right. Um, you could um, modify the language to say, you know, if it's a, if. Um, if it's applicable, that it would be, it would be, you know, either or, one or the other. Right, at least one six foot wide principal sidewalk leading from the street, uh, and optionally public bike path, yeah. to the discretion of the planning board or discretion of site plan approval. But I think that I hate to, to say to rule it out completely, as much as I'd say you have to do it right. because. Who knows what the site's going to look like? You know, if, if we do get the buildings right up on the street and it's a long distance from the bike path, then we may want a, a more secure bike path. You so. could say something like an or alternatively a bike path. Can it, 
Successful, not that we didn't try. I called Castle Latina, tried a number of times to have interactions with Hampshire Heights residents. And I think this should not go forward until there is a meeting at Hampshire Heights. We, we, we got close, we got to the blue bonnet, but it didn't work. So I think to get input, exactly what you just said, I don't even want to repeat it because it's now been said, but that's, I couldn't feel more strongly in support of what you said. Thanks for saying it. And the second point is, and Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, I might not have heard this, but, and, and, uh, Steve, too. For me, the biggest debate wasn't so much about the buffers, it was about the setback. 
and the big change is in the setback. And I just, I'm not wanting to get into the arguments about it now, but I feel, I feel it should be stated rather than just saying uh, we're going to have landscape parking lots and we're going to have eight or ten feet for a buffer. I think it needs to be said, and it gets back to your comment about the vision for King Street. It was vision versus economic development tomorrow. And the vision, I think, lost out. And I don't want to get into whether it should have or not, but I think it should be stated clearly in the record that the other big change is maximum setback is gone. We have a different way of conceiving of King Street than we did in 2002, and we have reasons that have been, I think, clearly stated, whether we agree with them or not. But that's the big change that we went around about. We had a charrette with three committees, and we couldn't come up with a full agreement. And now this is, there's a recommendation to eliminate it. And I think it has far-reaching impact beyond tomorrow. And I think we have to be able to look at each other and say that's what we've asked to have happen next. Is, is that, in your understanding, Carolyn, is that going to be stated as one of the big changes? Is it read like that? I, I, it was in the summary. It certainly is, has been part of this discussion. It's in the Steve tables, too. It. It's oh, in yeah. the tables. So yeah. I just don't, I think it needs to be stated tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. uh, three hands. Uh, oh. Suzanne hasn't spoken yet, so. <coughs> So I'm um, Suzanne Beck, the, representing the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce, and here to convey the Chamber's support for the zoning proposals that you're considering. Um, and also to say we appreciated the city opening the door to think about a new, a different new approach to King Street, and obviously it has created a lot of strong feelings and not always agreement. Um, so it was a it was a bold move to create that opportunity, and we appreciate having had the chance to be so deeply involved. My comments are more general and not specific to detailed zoning language, but this seemed like the only opportunity to make them. So if they, if they sound a little bit less, not so much like what's going on in the highway business, I apologize. Um, you mentioned, Steve, that where our first recommendations came back, came forward in June, and that was out of a process that involved people that lived um, on King Street business and property owners primarily. And we certainly learned a lot from those discussions uh, and even more from the public process that started with the ZRC. What I wanted to just give you a sense of is how the chamber uh, looked at this and how we approached um, the question about appropriate zoning for King Street. And there were some things that kind of rose to the top. One, you know, our pr primary approach was to look at the um, the barriers to investment on King Street and, and making sure that the zoning addressed those concerns. Um, you know, the, the, the barriers have been a factor in not only no investment, but disinvestment properties that won't be invested in because of the barriers to reinvesting. So there's a, you know, a deep consequence, I guess, in, in terms of, of that. And that's why it was kind of our primary um, objective. The to create a better environment, no question. Uh, King Street, you know, nobody seems to like it, and there's a lot that can be done and, and that the zoning addresses. The distinct characters, again, was uh, a big part of the discussion that we had and how important that was, as particularly as it becomes a gateway into the downtown area. Paying attention to how what happens on King Street <coughs> affects the residential neighborhoods. We heard a lot from the neighbors about um, issues that weren't necessarily related to zoning, but that's my uh, another point, is that we'd like to advocate for um, some public attention to King Street. It's really screaming for, for some public investment, and <coughs> it's pretty dreary in, in places, and not, it's, it, it, part of it, you know, is addressed by zoning and setbacks and, and, and green space, but you try crossing King Street you know, by where the mobile station is, just getting across the road is, you know, remar remarkably <coughs> hard. And that continues down even as you approach um, downtown. So look, looking at more than zoning, um, if that is under your purview at any time, would be an important recommendation. So our um, conclusions on everything that's been recommended, recommended, we certainly don't agree with everything, but really nobody does, I don't think. Um, but there are some really, really strong advantages of, of the zoning. One is that, uh, we, which we mentioned, the clearer, simplified, more predictable process, um, and ex the example of removing a special permit requirement 
not only it, it doesn't it not only makes it easier, it makes it more predictable for the developer, the investor, as a, as what's going to happen when it goes through the public process. Expanding the allowable uses, that alone could have a big impact on transforming the character of King Street. Just because retail has a you know a demand for a lot of parking in front, that may not be true for every use. That may take a look at King Street, a medical office, for example, was, or a hotel. Another positive is the emphasis on allowing rather than requiring. Um, that flexibility, again, opens up options for how, how someone would use the site um, and recognizing the three distinct zones in a way that where the zoning is actually tailored. I mean, there's been a lot of time given, thought given to what works best in entranceway, what works best in, in highway central business. And finally, uh, and, and the thing that we talked also talked a lot about was the um, we're accomplishing the objective of creating that safer environment for pedestrians and bicycles. And you know, the Nelson Nygaard study gave us even an even further idea of how that might be accomplished. So um, I hope you'll agree with us that the zoning proposals uh, represent the right balance of interests, um, if not. Uh, you know, agreement with, with every point of view, uh, that we did a good job. Um, whoa. <laughs> that, we did, that we did a great job uh, reaching a compromise, which you've all participated in, um, and that what is proposed is a significant improvement over what exists today. I'd like to thank the Office of Planning and Development, specifically Wayne and Carolyn. They've invested an enormous amount of time. They've been great partners in this. And also thank you. I know a number of you have been at a number of these meetings, um, not just for considering you know, the Chamber's input tonight, but your willingness to um, consider it throughout the process. Thank you. Oh, and I have a written, more detailed, um, something else with some comparisons. Uh, Eric? Um, I guess two points just generally. Um, I think that, that this proposed zoning proposal does keep its eye um, on the vision, the long-term vision for King Street to be an attractive urban, commercial, and mixed-use corridor, um, while at the same time allowing for um, development to take place in the here and now under current economic um, and market conditions. And I think that what we've experienced over the last 10 years is that some properties on King Street have remained vacant and underutilized, um, in part because of the zoning, um, not entirely because of the zoning, but in part because of it. And I think that this, is, this proposal is a compromise, and I think it's a significant improvement to help encourage development along King Street. Um, but that development that, that is going to take place under this zoning is going to be attractive. And, um, and I think um, that one of the goals of the sustainability plan was to balance our visions and our, and our goals across land use and economic development. And you know, econ economic development is, is, about, is about businesses and it's about jobs and it's about places to work. And it's about supporting our community financially. And you know, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. And I think that I think that we've made some progress here on trying to keep that balance. So I appreciate that. Um, a couple of tweaking questions and points um, on highway business in particular. Um, I support the idea of of um, the bike path connection uh, between a rear bike path and a building to have a lesser standard than what's required from the street to the building. Um, for the for the pedestrian way, um, the the entrance way, the aisle entrance ways in the parking lot. Again, feedback we've heard from designers is the recommendation instead of 18 feet maximum width, that for better safety and circulation, <coughs> that should be 20 feet. So that would be my recommendation. Um, I, I had a question on the materials section in the design guidelines. I think it allows for the flexibility for the board uh, to evaluate proposals case by case and look at materials. But I, I would ask the question whether or not Hardy Plank, which is a cement board product, 
um, which is now an industry standard both on the residential and commercial side for buildings, whether or not that would be allowed under these design guidelines. Um, I, I don't think it's considered a, a cement masonry product. I think it's a different kind of cement product. So um, I would ask you to consider that as an allowable material. And I thought I never thought I would hear myself uh, promoting vinyl, but I have to say I recently did some research for my own house. I didn't choose it, but vinyl actually has some pretty decent products out there now. And I think the issue is quality and durability. And if someone comes forward with a product that looks like it's going to look decent for a long term, I guess I would hope that you would consider that. Again, with an eye on cost containment. Um, there was some discussion earlier about whose responsibility it is to build out from the from the property side to the to the curb. To, so what what takes place in the public um, property side, and I think I understood from the earlier conversation that the planning board in past history has required and will continue to require developers to um, to improve the sidewalk and the tree belt. Um, I have a question about whether or not that now will include the cycle track, um, which is envisioned, it's shown in the diagrams in the design guidelines. Uh, one of my concerns is that we as a community have not yet finalized that the, the, the design for King Street um, and what that is going to look like. And I think it's hard to place expectations on developers uh, for something that we as a community haven't made a final decision on yet. Um, and I also think that to require a developer to pay for, to, to build out our vision of the public streetscape, that's an expensive proposition. And I think it actually could end up, again, to turn development. So it would be helpful for me to understand up front, and I think for developers coming in, to know what the cost sharing is going to be and really what they're going to be expected to pay for. So clarification from you on that point would be helpful to me. I think also in the, in the design, uh, and, and as part of our discussions all along, there's been the goal to try to minimize curb cuts um, and have cross connections between parcels um, to prevent vehicular traffic of people pulling out, pulling back in. Um, I also think that in some of the language, and it may have changed because I don't have the most recent version, um, that it also included pedestrian and bicycle connections between parcels. And I'm wondering, am I reading that correctly? Is that your intention? And I'm, I'm worried, again, about the cost of that. And I think that if we provide access points across parcels, I, I fully support that. I'm just thinking if we provide vehicular uh, cross connections, bicycle cross connections, and pedestrian cross connections, that again, that that significantly increases the cost of the development and could be a significant deterrent. Thank you. <clears throat> just a, a, a one, sorry, one second. Yeah. Um, just a couple things, uh, Terry. I, I think in our discussions, we're going to try to identify or address some of your concerns. But for number three, um, about the Hardy point, yeah. <coughs> if I'm wrong, Carolyn, we can't, by state law, we can't require them to build red brick or Hardy plank. We can make recommendations. But we, we don't have the ability, even with the design guidelines, to tell people what they can build. You can tell them what they can build, but you can say, here's the realm of things that... Um, but can we, can we restrict them? Can we say no hardy plank or no vinyl? Um, not not um, specifically, but, you know, if you review a project, I think, and, um, you know, there's... Um, I'm just trying to find a section here. It's a um, four, or sorry, five. Um, I mean, this is very broad language. It says, shall the materials shall be durable, high quality materials, um, but not limited to these other things. So the idea is, you know, if they're putting up, if, if you know, it's 
foam stucco that's going to fall apart in five years, you can say, no, sorry, it's not going to work. But if there's a material that, you know, looks like it's high quality that they're, you know, proving to you is high quality, I think, you know, that would be fine. So it could be any of those materials. Because um, I know this conversation has come before, like, why can't we require red brick everywhere? Right, but you can't do that. You can't say you can only have, you can only look like Nantucket. Right. Okay. Um, Unless it's, you know, in zoning. There are other mechanisms that people, that towns on Nantucket have done because it's a historic district. But right. that's under historic district criteria. <coughs> zoning. And just one other one about um, the cross seasons. I know when we redid, or when we did the, um, the permit, for the old price chopper, we had put in cross easements to uh, the left to Firestone, to the right to Willard. That was for vehicle traffic because we wanted to share the same traffic light. Because part of that deal is they're putting the traffic light at the entrance to that right. old price chopper. That was for vehicles. And I think Kara's question about bicycles are I'm not sure if we restricted it to vehicles or we made it such that it was just a cross easement to allow. Well, um I think um, it could be um, the section that, um, you know, that had been discussion before. In the current zoning, there's requirement <coughs> of adequate pedestrian access, including provisions for sidewalks to provide access to adjacent properties in between businesses within the development is required to be shown in your application. So the proposal is to show provisions for bicycles bike paths and sidewalks. Originally, there was language in there about cycle tracks, but we believe that because we thought it'd be too confusing if we're talking about the private side. The cycle track concept is really is envisioned, I think, if it is deemed to be the consensus of the community in the street infrastructure. So we don't want to introduce that language onto the private development side. But the idea is currently we require cross connections for pedestrians. And so we just want to make sure that there's a bicycle cross connection too. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to build a separate facility. It just means you have to think about how all of those things are interwoven so that you don't have to get in your car and drive to your next site. Or you could park your bike and walk safely to the abutting property. Right, so there's nothing in the zoning proposal that's before us that either that would exclude bicycles or pedestrians from using those crossing lines, or that would even encourage it. The, the current zoning. Right, you have to do two things on a current zoning. You have to show that you're separating pedestrian and vehicular traffic to the extent possible. And you have to show that you're making these cross connections. So you put those two things together, you can come up with probably 25 different ways of, of achieving that on any different parcel. But it's not mandating that you have to, you know, have it used at, used at individually for each one, necessarily. I guess my concern is that it's vague enough that when it gets to the planning board, that you could mandate for someone to have build out the on-street sidewalk, build out an on-street sidewalk, uh, on-site sidewalk that connects between the parcels, connects within the parcel, um, as well as a bike path. And I think that, that that's excessive. So I just, you know, common sense, I guess. And and I think it would be helpful for the developers to know up front what, what's expected of them. Thank you. Bill? Oh, oh sorry. Well, Carolyn, just to continue on that point. So I think from the from the from King Street to a building, we've got the, the buffer, the 868, to get from sidewalk to the front door. But we were talking about relaxing that standard from the bike path in the back to the door. So we don't need it uh, to build it out with an 868, you know, and then all these cross connections, you don't have to do another 868. So right. you don't have the Right. Parcel is so broken up that you can't park anywhere because right. it's all these cross connections. But you still have to provide a cross connection, right. whether it's a sidewalk or it's a shared bike. And yeah. some, you still have to show that whether it's painted. And, and if we review it and we're okay with it, then that's yeah. fine. Okay. Part of the challenge is you're looking at the site in its entirety, so you sort of you need all those tools to think about what is the best way. You know, you, if there are two buildings, you want to figure out what is the best way to make sure cars can move safely, pedestrians can move safely, and bicycles can move safely. And sometimes that's a shared route, and sometimes it might be a side route. Right, that was my point when we were talking about whether or not we wanted the buffer on the bike path, the bike yeah. path at the back, and the buildings to the front. There may be occurrences where we're going to look at the and that's what we're going to need because right. of the way the building's laid out. So I'd rather not exclude it, but make it at our discretion when we do it. 
but I think if a developer knows going in, at the very least, I need to provide this, this built-out buffer to get them from the sidewalk to the front door. And then I have to logically think, how am I going to get bikes across, pedestrians across? That doesn't mean I have to develop this huge easement cross connection, but I have to think about how it's all going to work together. All right, sorry, Bill. No, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, again, Bill White, 39 Merle Street. Um, in, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I was one of the sponsors of the 2002 regulations that we're now revising. And I, and I have to say that, that I'm, this has been a laudable process. And I also think it's a laudable outcome because the goals were also equally laudable, if I can use the word one more time. I, and, and, and by and large, I actually, I don't have too much difficulty with any of this. I, uh, the process that took us to 2002 started in 2000. It was also a two-year process that incorporated all the stakeholders, <coughs> uh, many of the people who were here tonight, actually, and some who weren't. But the fact is that it was a different time, different circumstances. Business was booming. Large-scale retail systems were, well, this is my disposition. They were predatory. And uh, they're not anymore. You don't see a lot of ambitious develop, development projects going up anywhere. I'm excited about a number of things in this, uh, the expanded use. I think that's a great idea. I think uh, whatever we can do and to encourage business development along King Street, that's not just exclusively retail. That's that's to our good. I also I, you know, relative to uh, Terry's point about the obligation of the streetscape, and Maureen mentioned this too. There is a concern. It's a larger concern. I think I, I think the goals in this respect are good the execution is going to be problematic. I think I like the idea of the design, except that we're, instead of we're doing it as one cohesive plan that the city, for instance, is going to lay down this beautiful street scape that will be cohesive, look thematically similar all the way down. Instead, we're going to have a patchwork of prescribed uh, uh, development construction that, you know, I've go down King Street now, there's the same requirements for all of them. Every new development person puts the smallest caliper tree they can put on there. And they and the maintenance of the of the beltway is pretty pathetic. And it's it, there is no it just looks like it's almost insulting because it's it almost <laughs> it looks like, yeah, we've met the conditions of the requirement of the permits, but we've never met the spirit. We don't really care for the spirit of it. I don't blame it. That's not their job. That's our job. The thing is, is that what's going to happen is the city doesn't have enough money to plow King Street, never mind redesign it at this point. Now, I hope maybe there is something in the offing that I'm not particularly aware of, but that'd be great. But the prospect of changing King Street is very appealing, but at the same time, I just, I, I think that if we cede over the control of the streetscape, to uh, just a condition of permit, there, that could be problematic just based on past experience. But I'll, I'll leave that for you guys to figure out. I actually still think it's a good objective. And, and I realize that I think that developers will probably consider it to be onerous in some level. One of the things when we were first discussing the changing of the zone, the, the, one of the concerns that really didn't come up, isn't, doesn't come up much when people relate the history of it, but it wasn't just to literally stop big boxes. I, I admit that that was a visceral reaction to start with, but it wasn't, as the discussions evolved, it wasn't the spirit of it. Actually, a number of things we were concerned with was, for instance, are we going to make zoning that precludes the possibility of locally, independently owned business venture? I mean, are we only creating zoning that, that deep pockets can accommodate? and? by exclusion, lose any prospective business owner who might have ambitions to open up something, keeping their retail dollars <coughs> in town. That's the whole purpose of it. We're trying to stop large-scale retailers from supplanting uh, or replacing or killing local businesses. And I'm concerned about that in this context, too. I mean, you know, and, I, and again, I'm not arguing against what's being proposed. It's just that I don't know how much 
I, I don't know how much of a consideration it is ultimately. I understand the desire and the craving for redoing King Street because it's blighted. Uh, for, as, as Suzanne mentioned, for a variety of reasons, barriers to investment, which I think the economy personally might look at this as a much bigger barrier than requiring trees of certain caliper. But to Mr. Weir's point, one of the things that we were discussing, of course, that inspired us to talk about was the vision of what the city was going to look like. Were we going to give over and say, yeah, King Street's going to look like hell, but that's the trade-off we make for making twenty, thirty thousand dollars of annual revenue for each large system that might be able to build there, which, by the way, doesn't pay for one teacher. But the compromises that we make, and these are all compromises, they're born out of discussions and consensus. The compromises we make are the, are the laws that we create, and in my, and I think what inspires us is a vision of what we have for our city. And I, I, and that's to say, I think you guys kept that spirit in this. So I'm, I, I know I'm not sounding like com I'm commending you all that much, but uh, the, to the point that Maureen mentioned, and it's something that I've mentioned in every meeting that I've ever gone to one of these things, and, uh, and it's what Tom was referring to, was accessed by two of the densest concentrations of, of residential property, where we have the densest concentration of people, many of them who don't have automobile access to these systems, and who live behind these systems. And we have, uh, we do not require the developers put in, oh, actually we did, I'm sorry, we did require, or it was a condition, I don't know if it was a condition or permit for uh, Dave Soda and Pepwood City and the CVS structure that allowed a pass through a gate with a uh, light system for uh, folks at Hampshire Heights. But Suzanne referred to the fact that crossing King Street is, well, it, it's damn near impossible. It's, it's pretty risky. And that's, I think that's on the city as much as anybody. But I also think that we should have built into this consideration uh, for those people, whether we hear from them or not. I don't, you know, they may never come to a meeting. Folks may never come to a meeting. It doesn't mean that we get they get precluded from or, or excluded from any consideration. Because you, you, we don't say, you had, you had a choice to chime in, you didn't. We tried so many times to approach you, you didn't talk about it. The fact is we should consider it regardless. That's our responsibility. And so I'm principally concerned in that respect, in all these design schemes and all this discussion, that's my number one concern, is safe access for pedestrians from those systems. That, and, and I don't know if we can, I, I don't have a, a, a suggestion on what you could do to do that because I don't know if you make it a condition or permit or not. But, and I know you've considered it. I know you guys haven't blown it off. I know you've discussed it and trying to figure out a way to do. But I, I hope before this gets voted on in the council that actually you come up with a notion. And I'll do my best to try and come up with something brilliant too if it participates. But, so, that's it. I mean, thank you. Thank you very much for the process. Thank you very much, actually, for the proposal. I think, I think by and large, it improves what we had actually said when we voted on these conditions. I said in my, in my final speech as we were doing the vote, I said this is not a period at the end of the sentence. This is a period. <coughs> the hope is, is that we'll, we'll, you know, other people will soon after us figure out with it, what we have now, we'll make it work better, still keeping in mind that what we're trying to do is create uh, a gateway and a look, but at the same time trying to create a, a, to, to enforce a, a, a spirit that we were trying to promote. And that was locally owned, promoting locally owned businesses, access by residents, and something that conforms to what we, and you can't put this in language in, in any of these documents, but what we consider to be the essence of Northampton. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one second, I just want to respond to a couple of follow-up questions from what Bill said. Um, uh, one of the things I think a couple of people have brought up is, you know, we're targeting King Street from the curb of King Street in towards the property. And at various times we've talked about there's plans afoot or designs afoot at some point to look at King Street 
the zoning doesn't cover what's on King Street itself. Bike lanes, dropping it down to three lanes, putting a median strip in it, none of that is covered by zoning. That's all infrastructure and stuff by the state and the city. Are there, is there plans to redo a start design process for King Street between the state? Or well, we're applying for a grant, it's sort of a long shot, so I'm likely to get. But there's certainly look, I mean, certainly a lot of discussions about how to refinance going to the next step. But the other thing, and this is sort of towards, again, what you're talking about, is uh, on David Road, was the state, isn't the state redoing David Road at some point, don't they have? Very slow. Very slow, <laughs> which includes the intersection of King and David Road. Correct. Okay. They've been doing that for almost 30 years. Okay, almost 30 years. Well, and in terms of what the planning board does, you know, well, again, we can't, we can't force people, we can't force bike lanes on King Street, but for example, when Cole Vest was doing the price job, but we got the stop in. So what we do as the planning board, we do what we can do to get money <coughs> from the developers to do things like get that stoplight put in the four-way walk to the signal. I think we're doing it at Dunkin' Donuts. Eventually, the, 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 the light cycle the part of the Donuts is going to be done. So what the planning board can do, what we can do through zoning, is we can get money from developers to do improvements on King Street to make King Street itself safe. But we do it in the industrial park. Every time somebody gets a permit in the industrial park, we get them to put in a couple hundred feet of sidewalk. So eventually, the industrial park will have a sidewalk going all the way through it. Because there's a sidewalk in front of Montessori now that doesn't, it used to be there that actually goes into the industrial park. So the zoning, we can do certain things on King Street. Infrastructure, the city and the state are responsible for other parts of it. But, um, so through zoning, we're, we're trying to do slowly what we can do to make King Street safer to cross, and that's it's going to be. We did that with the negotiations with Walmart, too. Uh, they, they paid into... Uh, a redesign for the access off of uh, King Street onto uh, channeling into Hatfield and Cook, right. and we We're got the, the design. Market, same thing. We're about the market. There's right. walks out there. Most we, of the developments we can get on King Street or in, in those areas, we, we're trying to get them to improve the infrastructure where we can. And what the council changed last few years that it used to be more of an <clears throat> ad hoc assessment of traffic impacts. There's now a formula in the zone. So any developer coming to town knows exactly what it is. They don't feel like it's a bathroom deal. They can look up the formula and say, here's what traffic mitigation costs for the project. Um, who's back? Dennis? Thanks. Uh, my name is Dennis Bigwell. I live at 19 Forbes Avenue. Uh, and I just wanted to say a few things more about process and the balance of this concept than, than the specifics. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Bill Dwight's perspective as uh, one of the authors of the 2002 ordinance. It was quite, kind of interesting to hear that perspective looking back. Uh, as many of you know, I've been paying a fair amount of attention to King Street zoning matters for a while now. I was on the Sustainable Northampton Steering Committee where we spent a lot of time talking about this. And then I uh, chaired the Economic Development Committee of the Chamber. Uh, led that process that you heard Suzanne Beck talk about, looking at King Street. And then I was one of the nine members of the Zoning Revisions Committee as well. And I have to say that wearing all those hats and kind of combining all, those, all of those different uh, perspectives and, and what we've learned, I think uh, what's emerged through sometimes the not the smoothest uh, process of it all is, uh, is a proposal that really is worthy of support subject to some of the tweaks that have been written by Terry Anderson and others, but I think as a whole, it really is a sound and, uh, and quite balanced proposal. It's not perfect, by the way, and we've heard a lot, of, uh, a lot of commentary on that. There's some things in here that I'm not terribly happy about. There's certainly elements in it that my uh, new urbanist friends on the Zoning Revisions Committee are not terribly happy about. There's pieces of it that I imagine wane and and, and Carolyn aren't totally satisfied with, and, uh, and, and Terry Anderson has expressed some, some areas where she thinks it needs improvement. It's, 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 it's certainly not perfect by any one person's standards, but you add it all up together, and I think it's a really solid proposal. And yes, it's a, it's a product of a compromise and consensus, but oftentimes that's the way the, the really good and uh, lasting legislation happens. I think it's substantially balanced in a number of ways. I think it's a reasonable balance between urban design specificity on the one hand and financial and economic reality on the other. I think it's a reasonable balance between the public input that has come from uh, a number of different forums around the city 
uh, on the one hand, and the expertise of building professionals and economic development professionals and planners, uh, and that, that, that very much professional expertise has been brought to bear in this process as well. I think it's a good balance between seeking buildings and landscaping that really looks good, and there's a lot of what we all want to see in, in Northampton, while making it possible that those buildings will actually be built. I think that's a real strength of this, is that wonderful visions of what it might be look like uh, really don't get us anywhere if it doesn't turn out possible to build that stuff. So I think this is a good compromise on that score. I think it's a reasonable balance between providing the opportunity for really badly needed tax revenues and jobs uh, while ensuring that what's built here is going to adhere to some pretty rigorous standards. And on the, and, and on the tax revenue, um, it's, this is not a trivial matter. Our, the, the, I think the accepted fairly conservative estimate of the tax revenue that would be generated by the city if the price chopper lot were built out, if the Honda lot were built out, if just those two lots were built out uh, you know, at a sort of <coughs> conservative de development standard, they'd be generating about $250,000 a year in taxes from those two parcels. So we're not talking chump change here. We're not talking about less than one salary teacher or, or one teacher side. We're talking about substantial revenue at a time when we really need it. So I think it's, that's part of the package that becomes possible with this. I think it's a reasonable balance also between allowing rather than requiring, but at the same time telling property owners and developers a great deal about exactly what the city is expecting. Of them. And I think it's a good balance between improving a corridor that draws a lot of its economic vitality, especially in the, the northern part of it, from automobile traffic, it's just a, it's just a fact of, of life, but at the same time promising that that corridor can be much softer and much greener and much more friendly for pedestrians and cyclists and much more attractive for those folks traveling through an automobile as well. And finally, I think one of its strengths is that it does recognize that King Street is not uniform from one end to the other, that it's worthy of looking at it in different zones. It isn't a one-size-fits-all proposition. There isn't one vision for King Street that I think the city is looking for, that the city deserves. So I think dividing it up into, into zones and recognizing that each of them in this chapter in the city's history is worthy of its own treatment is, is, is really quite laudable. So in, in summary, I would ask you to really respect the, the, the quite inclusive and thorough process that has brought it to this point uh, and, to, uh, and to provide your support once there's been some additional tweaking and questions asked, and to provide your, uh, your support for what I think is a good ordinance. Thanks. My name is John Skubisky, and I live at uh, Florence, 50 Hastings Heights. I'm a property owner up on <coughs> Upper uh, King Street. I find it's in this corridor. And uh, I guess my problem is uh, information. I, uh, coming into realizing what's happening, they're kind of late. And I haven't been able to follow uh, what's been happening there. But I'm getting a lot of information this evening. And uh, there's a lot going on there. And uh, for one thing, uh, I haven't seen a, uh, a map that includes my property or anybody else's up in the uh, northern section up near the co-op and I have considerable frontage over there and uh, I would like to know how that's carving up my my property. Some of the boundary lines cut through a person's property and it creates problems and uh, I've noticed that in some of your maps there they're rather convoluted here and there and it's, it's, there are a few straight lines there for one reason or another. But uh, I think those people up in that area should be notified specifically that their zoning is being changed and uh, uh, what that means. And uh, there are other questions that come into uh, my mind as I listen to uh, what's happening here. And you're talking about sidewalks. Are you thinking of? Sidewalks all the way up North King Street to the co-op up there. Is that a plan? It's a dream. <laughs> well, what we've been doing is, if you notice, for example, when um, the co-op was redeveloped, 
we had them put in, there's a, there's a sidewalk, there's actually a handicap ramp that comes up from the sidewalk. Uh, I don't, does it extend all the way to Rock Ridge? Yeah. Yeah. No. It, it doesn't extend all the way. So, uh, for a Walmart, there's a sidewalk that actually goes towards Bridge Road, but it doesn't actually cross Bridge Road. So, eventually, the goal is, yes, we're going to have a connected series of sidewalks throughout the entire city, but until your property is developed, if it's ever developed, at that point, that would be one of the... Yeah. Using the, the traffic mitigation lane from the co-op, we have hired a firm to design, to look at the intersection of Hatfield and North King, and design sidewalks from the co-op all the way up to the gathering. So we have a design, whether we can get money from the state to actually build this separate I'm also wondering uh, about, uh, uh, not that I have an interest in it, I'm just curious, what's going to happen to Hill and Dale Mall over there? I'm gathering that retail uh, is well, not going to be allowed. The, the, the Coal West Group has a permit to build to, to, to keep the existing structure at the back and then put in two pads at the front of the building. So they have a permit that was approved before this zoning, with the old zone, with the current zoning. So they have a, a current, I think from the last I've read in the paper, they've secured funding to start the construction. So that's that plan was under the, the existing zoning, not the proposal. <laughs> but retail will continue to be allowed. It, the, the, the plan is to expand the number of uses allowed in private business but not take away existing. Uh, on your chart, you had uh, uh, uses, and one said offices. Does that mean professional offices, or does it mean uh, uh, retail offices, or what? What kind of offices are we talking about there? Any, 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 any kind of office, the, the real estate, the um, professional, used to refer to as back office, um, anything that's, um, that falls into that category. I think the concept is to generalize it and allow many more uses and not be so specific about distinguishing between the different types of offices. And what kind of lot sizes are you talking about for highway business now? Well, in terms of a lot... Suppose I wanted to sell a lot over there. Oh, is there a minimum lot size? Yeah. yeah. No, it's, in this case, you, you would probably sell a lot that's large enough for them to build based on the setbacks, which is basically zero. And with the, the function of the, the person you're selling it to. But there's no minimum lot size, I think. There's no minimum. This would eliminate limit, uh, minimum lot size and frontage uh, requirements that are currently. Right, so it's, it's not up in this, but I can read what it says. Lot size yeah, is zero. Yeah, yeah. Put it. Oh. Frontage is zero, setbacks are zero, uh, except for the tree belt. Uh, so it's easing the requirements on the, for the existing zone. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, here's some of my questions, and I, I think that perhaps uh, some further information along the lines to those people that are involved in that area I think would be most helpful and appreciated. I know you've had meetings, but like it's been said, not everybody can get to them, and uh, uh, and they should. Thank you. Sure. And, and in terms of the map, Captain Carolyn. <coughs> there's no map changes on the northern end at all. Uh, right. So the areas that are currently highway business stay. in the north stay highway business. So there's no map changes north of David Road. Yeah. North, north of the rail trail. No. So there's no so there's no map changes. The only changes for highway business. Uh, in terms of map changes at the southern end, where it's going to now start at the... At the I see. So, okay. So, uh, in the back. Hi, my name is uh, James Valeva. I own property on Carpenter Avenue in North Hampton. And um, I just want to support this project. Um, I've... Um, about the visions of North Hampton. I haven't lived in North Hampton for a while, but when I did live in North Hampton, I used to take walks downtown and Northampton wasn't what it used to be. I sat on that seat over there as a planning board and we made changes to the downtown area. And I can say after all these years, it's quite comfortable to be downtown. It's the envision that I had many years ago what downtown Northampton should be and it is what it is. And I hope that this plan would 
would include that type of philosophy and bring that up into King Street. So to make it pleasant to be able to walk from King Street to downtown and not feel a disconnect. Where, um, so I strongly support this uh, project and I hope that you would. Um, as people have said, there's going to be people who don't like it, there's not enough communications. You can't wait forever. You have to make a decision sometime. You can wait 10 years from now and still hope that everybody gets communicated with. I live in Fall River, Mass. I received all the information. It's very readily available. And I thank you for doing that, making it available to me. So nonetheless, I just don't wait too long to do things. Because the more you wait, the worse it gets. King Street wasn't what it used to be when I used to live here. And it needs to be changed. It needs to be brought up to what the downtown area looks like. And if you can accomplish that, I think you do a, a, a lot of good for Northampton. Thank you. Please wait on making a decision. I urge both the board and the committee to uh, keep the public comment open. Thank you. Okay, just to say your name and address. Owen Freeman Daniels, I'm sorry. Owen Freeman Daniels, 53 Woodmont Road, Northampton. Right the back. This guy? Yeah. Uh, Jim Nash, 18 Montview, uh, a member of the Zoning Revisions Committee. Um, I am supportive, very supportive of this proposal going forward. Um, I, um, I just want to throw out one little concern at this point, which is that uh, there are design standards that are being uh, developed to uh, go with this, with these zoning changes, and that, um, that a proper public vetting of those happen as well. I think it, when it, there was, towards the end, there was, uh, in terms of coming to a compromise, there was the, um, the, the walkway from the street to the building that was kind of seen as like a poison pill for developers that if you really want to keep, you know, move your building back from the street, you are going to have to create this beautiful walkway for pedestrians and bikes so it comes up to the street. Um, the other area that, um, that the Zoning Revisions Committee threw forward was this idea of the design standards and that um, that that was, we hadn't agreed on that. We hadn't even uh, gone into that. But that having that properly vetted, you know, before all of this gets voted on, I, I think is really important. Because it, it, it was an important, it's an important piece about this. And, um, and, and it was the area, of, uh, another area of compromise. So, um, so a little more public process. We've spent a lot of time in front of the camera getting to this point. I figured we spent about 100 hours in, in the ZRC, you know, 50 Wednesday nights and to, to get things to this point. And uh, so a few more public meetings, and, and then um, I'd like to see this move forward. <coughs> Anybody else from the public? Um, okay, so um, kind of summarize where we're at. Um, we've been through central business, entrance business, highway business. Uh, public comment is still open for all three, for both the planning board and ordinance. Um, we've had a couple of things that people brought up. Uh, uh, there was a couple issues. Uh, one of Terry's issues about, and I think Bill both mentioned about the light pole height with business. There was a discussion about uh, the maintenance of the buffer. Uh, there was uh, the question about um, having some more time to look at the um, design guidelines, especially around the buffer in uh, King Street. Um, so I guess um, we can discuss what our next steps are going to be. We, as a planning board, have a meeting on the 22nd of September that will allow people to kind of digest what they've heard. We can, we can reconvene. We can try to attempt to, if it works with you all, meet on the 22nd if that works, if that's what you want to do. Um, so we can talk about that. Yeah, I do actually want to make one more comment about the, this. And it's, it's back on the, it's the setbacks and the height again. The two things that really define how a street feels are building setback and building height. 
not granting, not some badly maintained buffer, but the physical building. And it doesn't have to look the same as central business. But it, I don't see why it should be a sea of asphalt, which is going to be empty 90% of the time, with some big box store bobbing on the horizon. There are plenty of examples around the country of successful economic developments where there's <coughs> some parking in the front and majority parking around the back, and that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't just be saying, yes, you can have as much parking around the front as you want, and we don't give a damn what it looks like because some developers think that that's the only way it, ha it can possibly be. We should be more visionary than that, and we should say, uh, you can have some parking there, and you can have some parking around the back, and people aren't that stupid. If they, people live in the area, and you figure out that Walmart has a big parking lot around the back, you don't just say, drive along on Christmas Day and say, oh, there's only 10 spaces at Walmart, and they're all full, I'll drive to Hadley. You know there's a parking lot around the back, and that's where you go. It's not... I mean, I do support the... We do need economic development, but we also need a town that we want to live in. And we don't want to look like... I don't want Northampton to look like Route 9. And I don't think it should. I mean, it, it's absolutely <coughs> wrong to call... Uh, a, ha a, a planting strip, even a very nice one, as some sort of compromise for 400 feet of asphalt. It's, it's, just, it's just pernicious. And I, I, I absolutely cannot support it. Um, and that's my rant. <laughs> I was kind of... I wanted to focus on this a little more what our next steps are. <laughs> well, I wanted to say it in, in lieu of what every, everything else has been said, and now we can move on to what we do next. Um, you were just asking about a next date that ordinance could meet with planning board? Yes, that's what we want to do. I mean, I was, I, there was one option to meet. You, you just could, mentioned the, the 22nd of September. That's, that's right, much too soon, I think, in terms of being able to move forward on this. That's only two weeks from today. So in light of what's been said in terms of outreach or, you know, doing anything like that, I just think that two weeks is not enough time. Sure. Myself, I don't know. The other thing is you guys, could, I mean, you could have separate hearings. You, the, the idea is to create, uh, you know, to the extent possible, um, have information presented to both boards. But, or alternatively, October 13th is, a, is a, another planning board um, date. Um, and then I think you said Ordis Committee meets October 18th, is that right? So I don't know if those two dates are, um, have a good, better timing, and you might also want to discuss what that outreach is and who might be involved in that or who might be initiating that and how that might happen. Because right, you wouldn't so want the months to go by and not have that. Yeah, so if, and one of the things we could do, um, we, could, we, could, we have time tonight, but we could you know, have our discussion tonight about what we want to do next. Um, and um, uh, I'm not sure what the city, for city council, the only deadline I think we have is, I would hope by the end of the year, because I don't know what the rules are with city council that you can carry something over year to year. Right. I, I don't know what those rules are. Well, a couple of things. We can vote to carry it over to the next session. If it's possible. To okay. Do that, so. It's already been said that. Well, certainly no votes can happen on anything that has a map change tonight because people haven't been notified. So we know that. Um, I mean, you could theoretically do that before your next meeting. But the other things that came up were the possibility of doing some, I don't know, maybe on-site meetings at Hampshire Heights. That came out of a member from the ZRC. I know we talked about it. I know Dennis and I talked about it early on, about trying to bring folks in and maybe you know, the fact is that there are transportation issues for people to be able to come down, and there are child care issues and language issues and, and a lot of things to consider. Maybe there would be a way, as was suggested to, um, and I don't know exactly how it is, but I don't think that bringing these tables in a PowerPoint presentation necessarily to folks at Hampshire Heights is going to garner the kind of input that we need. And instead, it might be some sort of session that would be open-ended in terms of asking people um, what they need or what, what, what they would like to see and then trying to take some of that material and see where it, where it might fit in here. I don't know how that would happen. 
Um, I could certainly be involved as a ward counselor, um, but you know, we have other mechanisms. We now have the city blackboard system that could phone people and let them know. I mean, there's there's flyering. Um, I don't think it, it, it it's something that would require postage mail, but I don't think it costs much for us to do uh, the phone, you know, the phone calling uh, to a dedicated group neighborhood there, and, and certainly the folks at River Run, um, the majority of whom are tenants and non-property owners and wouldn't be notified by mail anyway. So those are my couple of ideas. <coughs> I was just going to um, pick up on Andrew's comment a little bit. It seems too bad that there's a sort of polarized view of vision, um, the, the aesthetic qualities of the entrance ways to the city versus economic development. You know, it seems like there ought to be a way to do economic development in a way that's going to have real aesthetic quality. And I think perhaps that's where the design standards come in. It also, you know, I tend to agree with Andrew about creating the, the streetscape that is, um, you know, substantial buildings um, that are right up to the edge of the street as much as possible. But I'm just wondering if why that runs against uh, the ideas of economic, effective economic development. And I know this isn't exactly a, con that's not where you want the conversation to go right now. You want the next... Well, as a plan board, we had those conversations over months already, so I mean... But we it, can it got polarized, like one or the other, rather than how do you create something that's going to work uh, in both of those uh, areas. And I would like to see the conversation not be polarized, have it, have it be something that's aesthetically attractive and uh, be accepted on development needs. So... So are you talking about a review of the, the design guidelines? Well, I think the design guidelines are going to be crucial, yeah. I think that's going to be very important to make those really clear, not just fuzzy. Not to say we have them, but really what are they? Let's throw this over here. One more. It seems like um, the bulk of this discussion was on highway business. Central business, there was, I don't think there was any discussion. And if we had a map change notification, we might get that, but even vote it. We can't do that. But it seems like when the notification goes out, there seems to be a consensus. We could deal with that, get that one out of the way. <coughs> Entranceway business, there was limited discussion, a couple of items um, that weren't further discussion, but it seemed like we're close there. And I don't know if we project ahead to the next joint meeting where we can tackle two out of three. The highway business, I think, needs more public input more discussion, and I don't think in the next meeting we'll have enough uh, to vote on it then, but it seems like we should and could have enough to get two of these items out of the way, and I don't know if we need to vote on all three at the same time. A part of me feels like we've been talking about this for two years, we have consensus on some items or are close to consensus, let's act, let's let's move forward on, on what we can and make a list that's this big, you know, this big. Um, but we, I don't think we can do that tonight, but I, I think we should we should force the issue and, and make it happen as soon as we can. And actually make the discussion of highway business later easier. Because you're That's all we're talking about, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, for the, in terms of the notification, Carol, um, <coughs> would, is it two weeks, or is it, is, it, is two weeks, would, would the 13th of October be the, the soonest we could do the map change? No, we could, just, yeah, we could do it early. Yeah. We could do it. Uh, the, uh, the one, the other thing to think about is, yes, there, there's consensus on, and there's agreement about these certain districts, but um, I think as a package, there was a lot of compromise across across the elements. So I think if you parse them apart, um, and then you start, you know, tinkering significantly, maybe it's not a tinker then, but if you start changing one aspect of it significantly. Um, that might have an impact on the compromise that was gained through some of the other sections. So um, I would also think about that. So. You couldn't separate CB from EB, then, so that was part of it. But don't you need to separate the two of them from highways? 
Well, I would, I would say the entrance business and highway business, there was a lot of discussion about, I mean, bringing the buildings forward in the, in the entranceway business was, I think, um, is a concern. It's still, it's, it, it's still considered, I think, um, pushing the envelope, I guess, from some side. So I would say that that seemed to be a compromise, that we want to take bits of King Street designs <coughs> and to push that urban design to the street <coughs> corridor. And if we we're successful at that, then potentially we could make, you know, move the line up the street. But I guess that's the only thing I'd, I'd point out that, um, you know, that might be a trade-off. Right. Well, I think this art, art consideration is not necessarily the same as the city council. And our process is not a political process. And we should approach this as planners. City Council is essentially a political body. They may, may need to do more outreach, but we, I think we have enough information to make a decision on what we recommend. It's <coughs> only a part of our process. Well, the, the, the places that, at least not the notes I have, that we may want to have further discussion on, uh, one is the, the design guidelines. We want to have further, this is the first time we've seen them really fully fleshed out. So I would say we could even, we could discuss those in more detail. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not saying we should vote tonight, but right. I don't think we need to. I don't think we well, we can because right. of the notification, we couldn't vote right. anyway. But, um, but uh, that's, that's, you know, it's a good point. You know, we as the planning board have been talking about this for a year. No. More than that. More than that. Thank you. Um, I would propose that we continue the hearing until the second meeting from now. 13th of October. Right. And then at that point, that would be, <coughs> we could even schedule, would, we set, would you be um, uh, willing to schedule that a discussion of the design guidelines for the 22nd or next meeting, or do you want to try to do it all in one night on the 13th? We probably would want to do it in, at the same time. Okay, so we just we do it all in one last one more meeting. Though. Yeah, I also think that we might as well just keep it as a package. Right. <coughs> okay. Do we have anything already scheduled for that October meeting?
seems like for those groups that we're talking about, um, I'd be curious to see with outreach what, what comes of that and what their um, issues are. But it wouldn't seem to be that the issues would be how tall is the building and what's the setback. It would be pedestrian access, the bicycle access, <coughs> vehicular access. And from a planning standpoint, the planning point, we spent a lot of time on that. And I think with the buffers and, and how to get from King Street to the front door and, and what we talked about tonight, bike access, cross easements, we spent a fair amount of time. I think that's what they would be more concerned about because that's where they are. And, and I don't know that we could improve to a great extent what, we, you know, what we've done, what we've already been talking about the last 15 months. Um, Mike, in that sense, it might, you know, if, if that if the conversation is that simple, at least it's an inclusionary process where we right. did right. everything we could to make sure that... No, I, I agree. I'm just saying, to, to Fanny's point, this sometimes we get away from ourselves and, and, and look big picture, political, theoretical, and, and we're not. We're, we're, we're playing. And if we focus on that and, and you know, design standpoint, uh, design guidelines and so forth, that's, that means further discussion, that's fine. But... Um, you know, setbacks and, and heights and easements and access, those, that's what we should be focusing on. It's possible, then, that the Ordinance Committee doesn't necessarily, that this could be separated out and the Ordinance Committee can just take some of this, uh, do some of this outreach and go to the City Council. Well, do you all, you all have a meeting Monday or you don't? We do. Oh, we can't no, discuss no, this. Yeah. 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 But can you, can you discuss it without... Not substance, but can you discuss your process? Or that's, that's you can't even discuss the process you guys want to use to move forward on your Monday agenda. And then you can contact, David can contact me as the chair if they need something from us. Uh, and they should set the date and continue this. I don't know if it makes well, sense to continue to hear. I, I think ultimately when we're done, I was going to move that we continue our public hearing to our meeting in October, I think on the 18th. That will cover whatever. You're going to meet before that, probably. We're meeting at the 13th. So that would cover it. And then if there was any tailings that we wanted to do on the 18th, we could do it at our public hearing. But that would cover us till October. We would cover whatever you did. We could participate with you if we wanted to, because our public hearing would still be open. And then we could, we could do whatever tailings there were on the 18th if there were. So you would, you would be OK with having another joint hearing on the 13th with us? Or whatever we could agree. I don't know if we can agree on a date tonight. So. With everybody's schedules without looking. Feel good. Yeah. Um, the 13th, you're going to have school. I'll be chairing the school committee. When's the meeting another joint hearing? That's what I'm wondering. Do they need another? Do we need a joint hearing? Or we could, you know, certainly, we're, we could attend yours. But your formal public hearing is yeah. extension. We could, we could yeah. post it as a meeting so the two of us showed up. It would be in violation. 
Or not. Oh, right. we, we don't have to have joint public hearings. No, no, I, I, right. but I, that's what I'm saying. What, what do we want to have? We don't have to, but it's just what's going to be best. So, so I think then what we're going to do, we're going to leave up the, open the public hearing. Both groups are going to open the public hearing. We're going to uh, continue to the 13th at 730 or 7? 7. 7. You all can then continue to the 13th. Yeah. Oh, well, no, I thought you said you were going to continue the 13th just in case two of you We're going to continue to our meeting in October, which is after the same thing. Right, but that's advertising. They might be. Oh, okay. Well, we'll advertise it. Yeah. Okay. And then so we won't. Right. And then we won't. Right. Because we won't right. yeah, we'll, we'll right. post it, too. Yeah. So if yeah. two of us show up and we're a quorum, we don't yeah. violate open meeting. Right. All right. But we'll still have it. Okay. So you guys want to do your program? Well, I was just going to say, in terms of outreach, because this does come from the planning board, then I've worked with you, Steve, in terms of and with, you know, maybe. Other interesting folks have said that they would just want to come to do outreach. Or you could, could you just do that as a work council and invite yes. the planning? Yes. You know, and other interested yeah. parties, yeah. Somebody from the community can connect with the Fox and Spanish. Yeah, because there's, there's members of the ZRC yeah. who would probably be, you know, with Tom and one Bob Rep, and there's, there's members of the yeah. ZRC who would probably be good back and invite them. Are you Spanish speaking? I'm not What do you guys want to do your motion? For the okay, I'll move we continue our public hearing until our meeting on October, which I believe is on the October. You should, you need to be date, time, and place. It is the 18th. Right? October 18th at 7 p.m. Yeah, we normally meet on the second Monday of the month, but that's Columbus Day, which is why we had to reschedule it. So, yeah, so that's why we're going to do All in favor? Aye. 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 So we'll need a motion for 7 p.m. October 13th. So we'll love second. that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll second it. Yes. Uh, all in favor? I've done it. All right, so we're going to be meeting again on the 13th here, and then you all on the 18th, and we'll be in touch about how bridge.
public comment. This is uh, a proposed ordinance change on the driveways. Anyone from the public want to speak to this issue? Mm -hmm. change to the structure that's there to the building permit that was granted. It's just giving a special permit under dimensional averaging because the average size of the lot is the median size of a lot in that neighborhood. Did everybody get a chance to, to go live and take a look at it? It doesn't look out of place. I don't know. No. Okay, let's have a public hearing. Are there any questions for the applicant? Yeah, do <laughs> <laughs> it's his neighborhood. <laughs> it's my neighborhood. I'm just, I just, uh, uh, just clarification. The, the, the uh, and lot size averaging, I think, is is perfectly fine. I have no objection to that. Uh, what's, if I may ask, what's the what's the plan for the for the site? And it's I'm all only, done. I'm sorry, it's all done. It's the house done. was built based on a plan that didn't have a title search. Got it. If it were an easement that has at more than adequate frontage, but because <laughs> the title search wasn't done when the bank foreclosed and when it was done, it discovered that it's not an easement 
but a right of way. A right of way has separate ownership and an easement. So for title purposes, it's not nothing is changing. Okay, sorry, so, so, sorry to go. All right, all right. So that that's what I was too curious about. So it, it's actually it's a cleanup process. It is. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you go by the house, you go, yeah. If you drive by today, <laughs> the house is there. <laughs> the, 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 right. Yeah, and, 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 and no, that's that's fine. That was just what I needed clearing up. Right. Right. That's the end of my comment. Does it verification? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's okay. I would Here. like to see a bike path go through there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you're cut off. Any discussion about closing public hearing? All in favor? Um, Brandy, you're on a roll. You might as well keep doing this. Okay, where are you? I move that we approve the request for East Hampton Savings Bank by East Hampton Savings Bank for a permit for dimensional averaging of frontage for 56 Summer Street, Northampton, MAP ID 31B is in Baker 070. Second. 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 Any discussion? All in favor? Thanks for sticking around. Thank for you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night. Um, all right. Um, I'd like to open up a hearing scheduled for 8.30 p.m. Request by Global Tower Assets, LLC. I'll tell them to come in. Oh, they're up. I'll wait till they... Oh, they're not. Sorry. That is that is laughing. laughing. Oh, why don't we just vote no? <laughs> <laughs> that was Kenzie for the state. Thank God. I don't know how I Chairman, members of the board, uh, my name is Gregory Mercier, here on behalf of the applicant. And uh, if I could just pull up the... Let's go start. Here. It's a little large, let me take the load. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just introduce myself and uh, everyone here with me. Uh, again, my name is Gregory Mercier. I'm from the law firm of Duval, Klasnik, and Pastel. Uh, here on behalf of Global Tower Assets LLC, the applicant. Uh, with me is uh, Elizabeth Thompson, also from my office, and um, Heather Cassignaro on behalf of Global Towers. Um, also with me uh, on behalf of AT&T, who is one of the co-applicants, is David Vivian. Um, Mike Doran, the RF engineer for AT&T. Uh, Mike Johnson, back here on behalf of Metro PCS, uh, Front Pierre, RF engineer for Metro PCS, um, and uh, Jesse Morano, the project engineer. Uh, get this started. Uh, I'd like to first give you a brief overview of the project, um, and at the conclusion of that, I'd be happy to take any questions from uh, members of the board or uh, members of the public. Um, the applicants are seeking a special permit with site plan approval uh, from the planning board for the installation of a five carrier monopole tower um, on the identified city owned property located on Haydenville Road. Uh, it's identified in the assessor's records as map 11, block 2, lot 1. Uh, the property is in the suburban residential district. And uh, pursuant to an RFP issued and awarded by the city, uh, Global Tower entered into a ground lease agreement with the city of Northampton on June 21st, 2011 for a portion of this property. Um, 
the applicants have applied for a uh, stormwater permit from the DPW. Uh, this was approved with conditions on August 4th this year. Uh, one of these conditions was to obtain a um, state highway um, permit prior to construction. Um, this is something we'll do prior to construction. Uh, this is for um, proposed stormwater discharge to the stormwater system owned by the Commonwealth. Uh, we were also before the Conservation Commission earlier this evening. Um, they voted on our notice of intent application to issue an order of conditions. Uh, so we're waiting for that. If you have any questions on the um, specific conditions issued, I guess we will be able to answer your questions on that a little later. Uh, just to give you a little uh, summary of the project. Here is the uh, proposed 190-foot monopole tower. It's actually, sorry, it's a little difficult to see. Um, the, the PowerPoint didn't come out too clear at the top. Uh, at the top here, there's uh, five arrays for um, the two. Uh, two of the five arrays are for the uh, co-locators before you ignite AT&T and Metro PCS. Uh, the tower has capability to um, hold three additional co-locators. And then also down here, town emergency equipment, uh, which can be put in in the future. As part of this application, AT&T uh, AT is proposing to install nine panel antennas at the top mounting height here, about 186 feet above ground level. Uh, below that, Metro PCS is proposing six panel antennas with an antenna centerline height of 176 feet above ground level. Um, cabling will connect these antennas uh, to equipment based on the ground, and that will be run through the monopole. Uh, here we have a planned view of the uh, project site. Again, sorry for the clarity. Uh, my screen at home it was a little easier to read. Uh, but basically here we have a 100 foot by 100 foot lease area. Uh, within that, there's a 75 foot by 75 foot uh, fenced area. And that's basically our compound area. Um, that's going to be surrounded by an eight foot high chain link fence. There's going to be a double six foot wide lock swing gate uh, to restrict access to the, to the uh, compound area. Uh, within this compound, um, AT&T and Metro PCS will be installing equipment shelters. Um, AT&T will occupy a 12 foot by 20, uh, 26 foot lease area up here in Metro PCS will occupy a 10 foot by 16 foot leased area right here. Um, within this fenced in compound area, we do have reserved space for three additional co-locators. Uh, as, as, uh, as part of this installation, um, we're proposing to install one diesel emergency generator. This will only be uh, used in the event of an emergency. Um, electric and telephone lines will be run underground from Haydenville Road. Um, access is also at Haydenville Road. And that will be via a proposed 12-foot wide gravel driveway. Um, there's actually an existing access drive right now. This will just be uh, an upgrade of what's there. Um, there's no lighting proposed as part of this application. Uh, we've received approval from the FAA for the 190-foot mounting, I'm sorry, uh, tower height, and uh, there's no, no lighting required for the FAA. And uh, the facility will be unmanned once operational. Uh, to give you a little background on the site selection process and why we chose this location, um, both AT&T and Metro PCS have significant gaps in coverage in, this, in the city of Northampton. Um, Global Tower has undertaken an extensive search of properties within the search ring, um, identified by AT&T and Metro PCS, um, and has, has identified the subject property as the only suitable location uh, for a tower that can fulfill their coverage needs. Um, I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Mike Doran. RF engineer for AT&T. Um, he'll, he'll be able to explain to you uh, AT&T's coverage gap and also uh, give you an idea of how this proposed mounting height satisfies that gap in coverage. Good evening. I'm Michael Doran. Um, our engineer uh, representing for AT&T. Uh, in this first uh, coverage mount, uh, what this mount is depicting is the existing coverage in the Northampton area. Uh, just to give uh, the council a baseline of the locations, uh, we're located uh, here in the center of town. Um, the focus of the attention here tonight is the uh, water tank that was decommed at the VA location um, and the proposal of the GTP tower uh, that Greg presented. 
Um, with respect to these, uh, this coverage, again, this shows existing coverage uh, without the site uh, online. Uh, this shows the neighboring sites around the area uh, in the town of Northampton, as well as the Williamsburg and the bordering towns uh, neighboring, uh, as well as the neighboring sites. Uh, what these colors represent down here, the signal levels, uh, minus 74, which is the green. The green and the blue are acceptable levels uh, that AT&T designs their network to. Uh, the green is a minus 74, uh, which is an excellent signal strength that uh, we use to provide coverage uh, in building environments, whether it's residential properties or public uh, venues. Uh, the blue signal level uh, is a minus 82 signal level. Uh, that is a degraded signal from the green minus 74, uh, but it still is adequate for providing uh, coverage in vehicles uh, as well as street level coverage. Um, the yellow and the red signal levels uh, continue to drop in signal strength, um, and those are unacceptable levels to AT&T where we design our network. Uh, they still provide some coverage on street level, uh, but as you go into mobile environments, uh, in vehicles or in buildings, uh, that's where uh, signal level significantly drops. Um, so our criteria is to design to the green uh, and the blue colors. So this map uh, again shows existing coverage as well as the neighbors. Um, these site numbers signify uh, locations. This is the existing uh, location that was previously online, again on the VA water tank. Um, this is the proposed uh, tower uh, just north of the VA location. Um, and again, the, the neighboring cells uh, in and around Northampton as well as the border. Not sure if anyone has any questions on this particular map. The good thing is my uh, my kids go to JFK, which is the middle school. Yep. Where this is now going to cover <coughs> because they're at and phones for the last three years. Excellent. Uh, or not for the last three years. Actually, it's like the last year. So I bet they, you when the water tank went down. So they would say, Dad, I, I can't hear you. And hang up. Yeah. No, they can't say that. They can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to refuse yourself? I yeah. was just going to say. No, they're at the high school. Now. I live there. I live there five years myself. <laughs> This map here uh, shows the proposed tower that we're hoping to build um, and co-locate at the top level. Uh, as you can see, uh, the coverage improves uh, the Route 9 Haydenville Road, uh, as well as in the Leeds Village area. Um, but it, it provides contiguous coverage uh, to our northern sites, um, and it provides uh, excellent coverage in the minus 74 as well as the 82 on the fringe areas covering uh, residential properties and other locations. As far as Route 9 to uh, the south, uh, this is where the coverage starts to deteriorate. Uh, the water tank site uh, provided a better coverage in and around this area. Uh, for AT&T, we still feel that this is uh, an excellent location uh, a good proposal because it enhances coverage to the north as well as the western uh, village areas. Um, and it, it, it leaves a, a bit of a hole uh, which is now towards a minus 92 level. So with respect to lowering antenna heights on the tower, it would start to severely degrade uh, around uh, the cell site and in particular uh, this uh, heading towards the more dense residential areas uh, would suffer down in this location. Uh, there is severe terrain. Uh, typically, water tanks are built on uh, locations that are high in height uh, as far as elevations. So if you were to draw a line from this point through, you would see that there is a, um, quite a challenge as far as the terrain in this particular area that blocks the signal uh, going towards the south. So RF, or radio frequency, is a line of sight technology. 
uh, any obstructions, trees, terrain uh, will block the signal and severely degrade it. Uh, the height is critically uh, important to AT&T to be at the top to provide uh, similar coverage as well as improved coverage in the area uh, to the residential uh, and the mobile users driving through. Not sure if the board has any questions for me or... Actually, the only question I've had so far is uh, at 190, was 198. Isn't the um, the cell tower in King Street that has a, a, a light on it? For yeah, that's closer to the airport. So the fact oh, so it's it's right. yeah. the airport. Oh, it's basically right. to the airport. Two thousand feet. I don't know. Oh, okay. I was just surprised with it. They didn't want a light on it. This tower is 190 feet, actually. It's, it's lower than that one. Oh, no, Anytime you get closer to the 200 foot level, uh, that's where the FAA starts to be more critical. And as you get closer to airports, uh, that's where there's uh, a detailed analysis that needs to be done to flight paths coming into the right. The one I think is much closer to the airport. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you I was just I was just going to kind of explain the FAA. Anything um, below, uh, uh, above 200 would automatically uh, require marking and lighting for okay. safety, but anything below 200 doesn't unless it's near an airport, and then essentially there's sort of a flight path below. Right. By their discretion. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, one other question I had, uh, Carolyn, your staff recommendation, you can't comment on this because it's on city property. Well, I mean, I could, but I just felt like it the city negotiated a lease for the global tower, so it's obviously in the interest of the city to get to have the permit <laughs> granted. So I think that you know I gave you the information, but in terms of a recommendation, the zoning is pretty clear on how you can grant a permit and how you can't. But I, I just you know the only recommendation I wanted to give was um, in granting, just to ensure that you've got you know you cover the issue I think here, not meeting the setback, so you need a special uh, site plan approval for that. Um, and then also um, you need to make sure that you understand what the bond level will be for removal of the tower if it's ever abandoned and, um, and not used anymore. So those are, that was my recommendation, but I want to give positive or negative one way or the other just because it is a city. And because the, this, the land is actually owned by Smith Boat, so the Smith Boat get the money or the money goes to the city? Um, I think it goes, you know, I have to look at the language. It might be directly to Smith Oak, but I don't want to speak out of turn because I wasn't involved in the, um, the good plan, at least. Okay. And do you want, I'm not sure who would, which of you, uh, uh, the presenters, uh, 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 Mr. Mercier, uh, the idea of the performance bond, so if and when the tower has to come down, have you been, do you know about this? Are you aware of this? Yes, um, you know, we'd indicated in our project narrative that we would uh, you know, come up with sufficient surety for removal uh, with the city. If you require a removal bond, we can... Uh, do, you have the numbers with, do you have the number? I, I, I didn't hear what the number is. Um, what the bond is going to be? There's, I think the number within there There's no estimate. Okay. Okay. Uh, gen generally, they're within the range of $15,000. Um, you know, we'd be happy to uh, provide one as, you know, if you if you choose to um, issue an approval with conditions, maybe have that as a condition of approval. Uh, we could we could certainly provide the bond prior to um, issuance of the building permit. Or um, I can double check. I feel like twenty-five is the number we've given for poles that include facilities, whereas just pads on buildings we've gone lower than that. But um, I, I twenty-five stands out. I would have to look at. Could we if we put a condition on? Could the, the price be something that is agreed on between the applicant and staff? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That would be okay? Yeah. Okay, because we, yeah, the, we have press in the city, so we just want to look at what you sure. are, if that's okay. That's great. Right. And actually, if I could just address the, uh, the setback issue. Sure. Um, uh, basically, the uh, zoning ordinance implies a uh, fall zone setback equal to twice the height of the tower. Um, so in this case, that would be 380 feet. Um, however, they also do go on to state that um, we can uh, request a reduction that the planning board can grant if we can prove that uh, the design of the tower allows for the tower to fall entirely within property control by the applicant. Um, 
So essentially, there, there is a requirement stating a fall zone twice the height of the tower. Um, but logically speaking, if the tower was to fall at its base, um, it would only fall the height of the tower, which here is 190 feet. And uh, the actual setback is, um, I apologize, I don't have it at the top of my head. I believe it's 343 feet. Yes, uh, 343 feet. Um, so whereas 380 feet would be twice the height of the tower, uh, we're set back 343. And uh, we do have a letter from our project engineer, uh, Exhibit 17, in your application packages, uh, stating that the tower is designed to collapse onto itself. And in the worst case scenario, it would fall uh, 190 feet from its base and still be well within uh, the property controlled by the applicant. And therefore, uh, the board is authorized to grant a waiver from this section should it choose. Is this totally undyed? Yeah, it's just a monopole tower. Totally undyed. Correct. Trent, what, what, what is the setback for me in the I'm sorry? But it's within the area they control. So Smith, you don't, you don't want um, foresters wandering around cutting trees and getting hit with a pole. Yes, <laughs> if, if you were actually to... It <laughs> would be bad. If, if, if you were actually to draw a, a setback to the nearest structure, the nearest structure is about 1,500 feet away. Yeah. But yes, if there's a, a lone logger, you could potentially get injured. All right, so you have 343 and Jill's 380. Correct. Right. It's hard to imagine how a 190 foot pole would fall that far away. We're probably designed. Where was Mamba Jack? Yeah. So, Carolyn, um, they need a um, special permit. Would be clear about that? Yeah, just in the decision that you're um, granting that waiver based on the information provided in the application. So the conditions we have so far are the waiver and that the uh, performance bond is a true value uh, determined by staff and the applicant. Sorry, Brandy. How about DPW conditions and cost? Yeah. yeah. Um, is the, does the DPW have to do a stormwater because the disturbance put in the cables is over an acre? Uh, I think there was a, uh, didn't it? or you were less. You were just under an acre, is that right? No, we were over an acre and we submitted a permit and we received a permit condition. Right, I was just saying, because it, usually it's over an acre they have to disturb to get Right, right, right. Um, and were there any conditions on the DPW permit that we should be aware of? Mm -hmm. And DPW didn't have any other comments about the special permit application. And uh, usually the cons come, uh, we're not. Yeah. Cons really come, good. looked at it. No, no, we're not. We're yeah. not yeah. And they, and they, 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 had to get, they had to get a permit from cons come. Right. And that was tonight. Right. Well. right. So things like impact on the forest or, or what Smith Oak thinks of it or all that is irrelevant to us. Right. Any other questions from the board, Mark? Um, there's a, an emergency diesel generator. Is that something that cycles every week? Um, and then so there's it produces noise every week, every Tuesday morning or whatever it is, or is it? Is um, it I believe it's tested. Uh, I'm not sure if it's once weekly or monthly. It's typically a, a monthly uh, uh, cycle, just just a, a schedule. Sure so it does it on its own, or somebody has to go up there and, and manually. Uh, we have a cell tech will go, go out and, and run it. Um, there's battery backup uh, in the event that it doesn't kick over if there's uh, uh, loss loss of power. It's uh, we're running a temporary a cell on wheels up there right now that's uh, running. Uh, around the clock on, on a generator. On general, my, my concern was just noise. I don't know how close this and is. It's, uh, it, it, it certainly would be in compliance with the noise regs at, uh, what is that, 50 dB at, uh, at the property line. It's well below that. What's the nearest structure at 1,500 feet? What is that? It's a uh, residence at 1,500 feet. So it's a like, residence? Uh, yes. It's, if, if I flip through here, I can if I skip a few slides. Um, here's the, uh, the tower site is right here. Um, so if you go through the woods, the nearest structures right here. Uh, this is Haydenville Road, um, so it's, it's about it's about a quarter mile through the woods. Closer than the generators on the second floor. The generators at ground level. That's correct. But there's there's no sound. I mean, carrying sound to those. 
presidencies? Is that something that we have a that No, there's, there's no sound or no significant sound producing equipment up in the tower that would uh, spread out above the trees. And again, typically that's that's only uh, only tested, say, on a monthly basis. It, it, generally, it's uh, it's only utilized when you have a microburst or something right. and you lose power and you got to run it. Any other questions for the board? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll open up to public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody from the public here to speak to this issue? Uh, all right. Um, if we close public hearing, we can't ask the questions anymore. Of the applicant. We all start with the applicant. Did the other people there have anything you were going to present? Or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we're all set. Um, <laughs> um, uh, all in favor? All right. So public hearing is closed. So um, we have the permit application. We have the two conditions. Uh, Grant the uh, waiver of the special permit for the setback to uh, 343 feet and performance bond. the performance bond for an option to negotiate between staff and the applicant. Well, let's just make it 25K. Well, I think Carolyn wants to look at what we've done for other power. She doesn't have the information. So I don't want to say 25K if we did 20 for somebody else. So, so, what's that? It's only money. That's not ours, so let's make it 10. <laughs> no, get a jump tower. No, let's let, let them, let the, Carolyn. Okay. Um, all right, so we have the two conditions. Uh, the waiver of the special permit for the setback to 343 feet. Uh, and the performance bond for the option to negotiate between staff and the applicant. Go ahead. Come on, Rayla. Right here. What's the voting issue? I'm sorry, Oh, no, special permit. You can vote. I know, that's what I'm saying. So he's voting yeah. for uh, debit. Yeah, all right. So, um, so the waiver of a special permit. Is just read, yeah, just read exactly what that says. Okay. Move, move, move. Um, I move to approve the request by Global Tower Assets LLC for a special permit to erect a new monopole uh, cellular tower facility off Bayman Bell Road, Smith Boat Forest, Forest uh, Florence Map ID 11 2. With the thought, with the conditions as noted. With two conditions. Motion and second. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 Wow, well, let's speed it up. Right? <laughs> <laughs>